uh, they, they sh you should have received the minutes by email, but a link um, has also been put in the chat, I believe. If not, we can redo it. This is uh, pretty pro forma. These are the minutes from last year, December's annual meeting. So if there aren't objections, I would love a motion uh, to approve uh, from anyone who wants to do that. And make sure you give us your full name so that uh, uh, Brian can capture this for next year's minutes. This is Nancy, I'll make a motion to approve. And it's Nancy, last name? Stencil. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Brian has to get that, he doesn't necessarily know you. So, okay, thank you very much, Nancy. Is there a second? Candace, second. Can, is that Candace Alley? Yep. Thank you, Candace. So, um, let's just have a, um, let's just have a thumbs up or you if you know how to use it in your thing you can do the reactions you can just put a put a hand up in your screen or you can just put a thumbs up or wave if you approve okay i think we have we've approved the minutes so let me move on to the uh next agenda item which is the citizen action of wisconsin board slate uh we have two boards just so you know we have a a 501c3 board, which is nonpartisan, which is uh, Citizen National Wisconsin Education Fund, they elect their own board. Uh, the board, the, the organization that can do specific electoral work and advocate for candidates is Citizen Action of Wisconsin, and their board is uh, is approved by this meeting. And so this 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 list here, the slate, which we'd like an up or down vote on, is a mix of existing board members who've done a great job and continue to serve and additional people, um, all the new people on this list are from our regional co uh, organizing cooperative. So these are rank and file members being added to the board. Our boards also have, since we're an affiliate organization well, have over 40 affiliates, unions, nonprofits, also have affiliate leader, a mix of affiliate leaders and, uh, and, and uh, rank and file co-op members. So would love to get a motion to approve this slate. Do you want us to just do the thumbs up again? Oh, well, I need someone, one person to say, I, I, I'll, I'll make I, a motion. Yes. I'll make a motion. A, is there a place where we can see the slate? Are you screen share? Is there a, okay. another document it, that we can yeah, look at? Uh, I can screen share it right now. Sorry. Can you right. a link to the agenda that lists the board members in the chat? Can you all see it now? Yeah. Okay. So it's right here. It's this list. I would say the majority of these folks are already on the board and are and are renewing their board leadership and there are about uh, three new folks from regions. So is anyone willing to make a motion to approve the slate? Move it, approval, Candace. Okay, Candace Owley, uh, is there a second? Joni Anderson. Joni Anderson, second. So. Can we get a show of thumbs or uh, or hands in the reaction chart? Okay, uh, motion is approved. Um, do people want me to keep uh, to, to just keep um, an agenda up for you, or do you do, or not? Because I can, I, I I'll take it down. But if there's a request, let me know. And that there are um, uh, the links. You you got sent it. But there, but there have been links in the um, in the chat as well, and I think if, since the chat fills up, we can probably do, provide that periodically, because so people don't have to uh, fish around. Um, so, our next section of this is we give awards every year at the annual meeting, and so we give a couple kind of named awards uh, that are na actually named after people. And then we, um, and then we also have a number of awards that come from the uh, from the regional organizing cooperatives, from uh, from the organizers, and uh, and from suggestions from leaders. And so we're going to start with the the uh, the named awards. Um, the first award we give um, is called the um, uh, Dr. Farley Progressive Leadership Award, and the Farleys, Dr. Jean and Linda Farley, were many ways the founders of the single pair movement in Wisconsin and Gene Farley was on the board of Citizen Action for probably a quarter century. Uh, he, they, 
They both passed away in, in the last decade, uh, but we've named an award after them. So the first person, and, and uh, for these awards, we're gonna ask the people if they're available, the awardees to, to just speak for a minute, uh, just say something to you if they want to. So the first uh, awardee is Zena Bloom from the Healthcare for All Co uh, Organizing Cooperative. And she is on the leadership team. Uh, for those of you who know, the Healthcare for All Co-op is a, a coalition really of, uh, I mean, they're all members of medical professionals and healthcare consumers pulling together uh, to change this healthcare system dramatically, to seek structural reform, to guarantee healthcare is a right. And uh, Zena, who is a healthcare consumer, has turned her personal, own personal struggles with the industrial for-profit medical complex into action, is what Karen Kirsch, our Healthcare for All Organizing Co-op organizer, um, has to say about Zena. So if Zena's here, congratulations. And if you wanna say a few words, uh, <laughs> please do. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, first off, I'm just absolutely floored that I was even picked for such an award. Thank you very much. Um, I believe everyone should have health care and life care, actually, from birth to grave. And I'm going to keep fighting and try to be more involved this year than I, uh, this coming year. So hopefully we can get some stuff done now with Biden going into office. Great. Congratulations, Zena, and thank you for uh, your incredible work and for the work of all of the other volunteers in the Healthcare for All Co-op uh, and your work on the leadership team of that, of that organizing co-op. Uh, so great to have you. Uh, we had so much on healthcare, uh, Zena, that we have a second awardee for the Farley Award. Of course, there were two Dr. Farleys, so we think that's appropriate, uh, both Linda and Jean. And so the second is for, is for uh, Lewis Coleman, who is uh, who uh, got passed. He's a he's with the Driftless stuck the the, the Citizen Action uh, Driftless Organizing Co-op, which is the whole area of rural Wisconsin and and part of and La Crosse as well, from La Crosse uh, down to the exurbs of Madison that are in the Driftless region, the whole southwest kind of corner of the state and along the Mississippi River, and so Lewis. Uh, was was the the point person on passing a county resolution uh, for La Crosse County for Medicare for All, and that uh, those resolutions have taken off, and they've uh, they've been replicated in five counties throughout the state so far. And Lewis is very active on other issues and is a founding member of the Driftless Co-op, and is a major ally of ours in working with the city of La Crosse as well. So in La Crosse local government, so Lewis. Thank you very much, congratulations. And if you wish to say a few words, if you're on, uh, this is the time. Uh, yeah, thanks, this is a real pleasant surprise. I, I appreciate the award and um, I look forward to working with all of you to, to continue to pass these resolutions. It's really only the first step in, in a process. We're trying to get um, our, our counties to support it and our, and our, and our cities in order to put pressure on, on our um, US representatives and senators. So um, this is a continuing campaign and look forward to working with all of you to, to uh, enact Medicare for all. That's great, Lewis. Thank you very much. And thank you for all your, your, your activism and, and what you do in your day job as well, which is, which is related. Uh, so the next, uh, we have another named award that we give every year. It's called the Kavanaugh um, Progressive Solidarity Award. And so Jim Cavanaugh, who it's named after, was the longtime president of the South Central Labor Federation, was on the Citizen Action Board for a very long time, maybe longer than Gene Farley was, um, and was president twice and was president during the time in the Great, uh, great Recession where the organization almost uh, didn't exist anymore, almost went bankrupt. And so and, and was a great solidarity guy, was always there to do work for everyone else. And so he's still around if you go to Madison Labor Fest, but he's retired. And so we named this after Jim for all of his service to Citizen Action. And uh, you know, since volunteer work and, and uh, building a broader movement, uh, it was central to what Jim did. Uh, we are, she couldn't be here today, but we're giving this award this year to Bonnie Strauss, who is a member of the, uh, of the Southeast Wisconsin Co-op and is a retired labor leader, labor chief of staff, who's extremely skilled. And she's donated 
hundreds of hours to citizen action to help us with major human resources issues and follow all the laws and rules and to have a social justice organization that that lives up to its values in in, in its human resources. And so she is on call all the time with, for our associate director, for me, uh, for others, and to bring her expertise to bear. And she is so valuable that the union she worked for for years is still using her to bargain contracts because she is so good at bargaining them against big employers like big hospitals or nursing home chains, et cetera. So Bonnie at a conflict couldn't be here, but we're giving the Kavanaugh Solidarity Award to Bonnie Strauss. And so volunteer work, can a lot of it, what we usually do in Citizen Action is volunteer work on activism, passing resolutions like we saw before, but it also can be the more traditional kind of volunteer work, like helping us with a skill that helps us not have to pay for it ourselves and gives us more resources for organizing. If we had to pay professionally for what Bonnie has provided, it, uh, it would, would have cost us a great deal of money. And so it's great to have volunteers like that. We have others like that, but want to call out Bonnie uh, in particular for her contributions. So the next award we want to give is the is, is what we're calling the Organizing in Action Award. And this is for, and the next two actually, that both Organization Action Awards are for coalition partners that uh, we are working with and we think that have, have done a tremendous job. And so the first one goes to Medcalf Park Community Bridges, which is a neighborhood association in the north side of Milwaukee in the African American community. It is located in one of the poorest areas and most uh, de deprived areas of the state of Wisconsin. And they have done a tremendous job. They have been a, uh, a stalwart in, in, in the uh, coalition that we're part of to save St. Joe's Hospitals. Uh, uh, Ascension, the largest nonprofit hospital chain in the country, has been tried to, tried to dramatically drown Clyde, the only full-scale critical access, access hospital on the north side of Milwaukee, where most African Americans in Wisconsin live. And they also really ramped up their civic engagement programs in this election. It became a major player in making sure people voted in the African American community, which as you know, in a very close election, was absolutely critical. And it's critical to social and racial justice uh, to, 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 uh, to have large turnout from marginalized communities. And there is no more marginalized community in Wisconsin than the African American community, given the economic and the health numbers. And uh, we are now uh, working with them on a new health equity project, which I would say more directly is health racism, to, to take the nice word off of it, uh, that we are launching and that we're hiring a, an organizer to work on, uh, to work with Raphael Smith on our staff and Claire Zoutke, our healthcare director. Uh, so I w if there's anyone here, I'm not, I don't, I, I, if I got the message, I missed it because of the blur of messages, whether one of the leaders of Medcalf Park Committee Bridges is here to say a few words. Okay, I'm guessing uh, if you want to unmute, yeah, I, I may, they, they, they may not be saying anything. So thank you very much. And we continue, we're going to continue. We really look forward to getting to work with Medcalf Park Community Bridges to create the, the, the just Wisconsin that, that we all want as progressives. Uh, the next uh, Organizing in Action Award we are giving to Progress North, which is, so uh, we're going to a totally different corner of the state. This is a brand new organization that is in Ashland County, Bayfield County, Douglas County, and Price County. So an area of the state with very little progressive capacity. Uh, they are an affiliate of Citizen Action Wisconsin, which means just like many of the nonprofit and labor unions that they have an organizational membership. We have those in addition to individual memberships and we coordinate with them and work with them very closely on a lot of issues. And we work very closely with them in their first year where they built a lot of capacity on the race class narrative methodology that Citizen Action was a leader in bringing to Wisconsin, which helps us break down the coded strategic racism that keeps a lot of voters from voting their true, true self-interest that we use in the deep canvas. They were partners in the deep canvas, uh, which is deeper conversations with people to bring them around and to decode all of the reasons they might be voting against their interest and for uh, you know the, the wealthy and billionaires who seek to divide us for their own benefit. Um, and, uh, and our big election program. And they made a ton of phone calls for Citizen Action member ca uh, candidate, Tricia Zunker, who ran for Congress in the 8th Congressional District. And they played a role in ensuring Democratic victories in Assembly District 73, 74, and 87. And they also have been working with People's Action, our national affiliate, 
and played a role in their volunteer text and phone peg programs, which also expanded all of our capacity here in Wisconsin. So they add another piece of the capacity for us to work all across Wisconsin by having a close partner like them go and build capacity in that part of the state. And that I frankly used to be one of the progressive bastions of Wisconsin, it used to be, you know, the Douglas County's in the Iron Range. So is there anyone from Progress North that wants to say a word or two who's on the call? There sure is, it's Shanu, Robert. Hi. Hi. So I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, and you're likely gonna hear my one and a half year old in the background, so my apologies, but she is uh, eating some Cheerios next to me right now. Um, which actually is just par for course in this crazy year that we've had, um, where she has often been working right alongside of me in my house. Um, I We're just super grateful to even be recognized, I think, like reflecting on this year and our partnership with Citizen Action, um, it's really an example of what can happen when you center building people power and relationships and truly trying to turn the tides um, across the entire state. And I don't think that we could, like I, I was sharing with Angelique the other day, I'm not sure we could have um, ever imagined where we would be at the end of this year and that wouldn't have been possible without our partnership with Citizen Action and the staff support and guidance um, and just commitment and investment in our leadership up here in the north um, from you all. Um, you know we work most closely with Angelique and Zoe and the field team but really I could like 100% attest to the fact that no matter what we needed, like any staff member that we reached out to, uh, like Matt and Joanna, any of the organizers, like Ben and Noah, really just stepped up and supported our work. And we're just super grateful for that. I think when we started the beginning of the year, we didn't necessarily know that we would even be able to exist beyond this year. So we're really grateful for all we were able to do and build together with Citizen Action and just um, super thankful for, for the recognition. Um, and I just want to, I know a couple of our staff are on here too. I saw them. So just shout out to my like super hardworking and dedicated staff um, at Progress North because they um, have just been so clear. <laughs> Oh, she, she's got lots to say too. Um, she's, my staff has just been super clear eyed and passionate about this work. Um, and super grateful to them. And so thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. And we're super grateful for the partnership and the work that we are doing and the, and the power that we're building together. So thank you. Thank you, Shanu, and congratulations. One of the hardest things to do is to start up a whole new organization and you've done it tremendously well and, and have already built a very impressive team. So I hear lots of reports from Angelique and others about all the progress you've made. So congratulations, that's in all of our interests uh, to shift Wisconsin in the direction it needs to go. So now we have a series of, uh, I gotta try to run through these as quickly as possible, of awards that came from the individual, um, individual organizing co-ops. So for, th for the award of Movement Politics Champion, uh, Monica Cruz, from the Driftless Area Organizing Co-op. She's a Lacrosse La County Board Chair and elected leader who, uh, who we can count on whenever we need her and obviously is also a volunteer and a core leader in the Driftless Organizing Co-op. So thank you very much, Monica, for everything you did. Um, also from the Driftless Co-op, Kathy Allen at, for a climate leader of the, uh, of the year in that co-op. Um, she is a, she's on the leadership team of the co-op. She's the president of the lacrosse chapter of the Sierra Club. And uh, Ben Wilson, our organizer, says she is the, that's all capitalized, climate leader in the Cooley region. So thank you, Kathy. It's great to have you working with us and, and, and be, a, be a part of the team. Uh, we also have in the Driftless Co-op, Joni Anderson as volunteer for the, uh, of the year. Uh, she is, uh, she, apparently we cannot, according to Ben, overstate Joni's contributions to the Driftless Co-op. They've been so tremendous. She's a leader on the rural issue team that, is a, that the Driftless Co-op has, has created. 
and she is joining um, our, our Citizen Action Wisconsin Education Fund Board of Directors for 2021, our 501c3 board. And she's, of course, a founding member of the Driftless Organizing Co-op, which really only was founded, started very late in 2019 and has been built up in 2020. And so that is our newest regional organizing co-op. And she ran a very robust uh, race uh, for the Wisconsin 14th State Senate District. Uh, one of those gerrymandered districts, and we need people to put up the good fight, even if they don't end up in, in the legislature, they help the top of the ticket. And of course, we know that the top of the ticket barely won this this state. Um, so next okay. is, uh, yeah, woo woo everyone, anyone who wants to uh, clap or make noise. Um, Ken Hood, who is a member of the Northwestern Wisconsin Organizing Co-op Steering Committee, um, and, and has done a great deal to help recruit and retain members um, and just promoted our platform and just done everything he can to help build the uh, Northwest Wisconsin Organizing Co-op. So thank you very much, Ken, uh, for your contributions. That's Volunteer of the Year for the Northwestern Wisconsin Co-op. Uh, also, the Healthcare Leader of the Year for the Northwestern Wisconsin Co-op is Rita Simon, who is on the uh, Healthcare Issue Team for that Organizing Co-op and has made a special focus, not only in understanding health policy, uh, but also on COVID-19 relief. And we know that COVID-19 is just a tremendous, uh, is, is a healthcare issue and also an economic issue because of the repercussions. So thank you, Rita, your name comes up a lot. So thank you for all your work and your activism. Uh, next, we have Nancy Kraft for Volunteer of the Year in the Northwestern Wisconsin Co-op. And she's on the steering committee and uh, she's helped a great deal with rural organizing and membership recruitment. So Nancy, thank you very much. And she is, uh, uh, if you could, I should be saying what towns the, all these folks are from. Um, let me just say that just to give, to give you a sense of, of where people are coming from, um, Monica, Monica Cruz is from Alaska, Kathy Allen's from La Crosse, Joni Anderson's from Adams County, Ken Hood's from Chitak, uh, Rita Simons from Chippewa Falls, Nancy Kraft is from Sheldon, Wisconsin. So you can see that all of the medium-sized, small towns, rural areas are well represented here. Uh, next, we have Mo Movement Politics Emerging Leader of the Year for the Northwestern Wisconsin Co-op, and that is Sarah Yacoub from Hudson, Wisconsin. And she ran um, one of the strongest campaigns uh, for assembly in a gerrymandered district and she uh, remains a true progressive uh, champion and supporter of our platform, and and a and a close and and, and, a, and, a, and a real friend to progressive causes and to building power. So thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you for running such a strong race. Uh, also for the Northwestern Co-op, we have Jody Emerson for Movement Politics Champion of the Year, and Jody remains a strong ally with Citizen Action and practices co-governance with our members. And, and, and our citizens. Okay, I, sorry, I got G-chats from people. Uh, the question that got asked, it's not a problem, don't worry. Um, so, uh, for Nancy, uh, I said Nancy Kraft and Syria Kube, and I just said Jody Emerson, so thank you very much, Jody. Jody is from Eau Claire, and uh, and she is also, of course, as folks know, a state representative uh, from Eau Claire. Um, Northwestern Wisconsin Movement Politics Emerging Leader of the Year is Emily Burge from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And she uh, also ran in a very gerrymandered district uh, and, and really ran on strong progressive platform, progressive values. And uh, she, she has a very strong focus on building uh, power and, prog and, and progressive values in, in, in rural Wisconsin, which is absolutely crud critical. And then we have from the Northwestern Co-op, Kate Beaton, who is on the, from Eau Claire, on the Eau Claire City Council, um, and has done a great deal on the Eau Claire City Council as, as an ally of ours and opposed uh, a number of uh, right-wing or, or business initiatives that were, that were, that were highly problematic. Um, I, there, there was a lot that she got done locally. I was given a, a, probably too much to read here, but Kate also is very, very active and her name comes up quite a lot as a, as a, 
as a, as a critical leader up in Eau Claire. And, but her fight against COVID-19, that we're calling this the Fight Against COVID-19 Award, uh, is it, what the Northwestern Wisconsin Co-op wants to call out about Kate Beaton's work. So thank you very much, Kate. And then we have the, uh, uh, the Education Leader of the Year is Chris uh, Hambach-Boyle from Eau Claire. And he created or was a leader in the whole education team that uh, Northwestern Wisconsin Organizing Co-op has. Um, and really fought against the voucher program and the funding of Wisconsin public schools. Voucher program is one way that that happens. Um, and so is, has, has really driven that piece of work up in Eau Claire. Eau Claire. So thank you very much, Chris. And also from the Northwestern Co-op, uh, Chris, Kas uh, Chris Kastner from uh, Boyceville, Wisconsin, Healthcare Leader of the, War of the Year. Chris ran as a Democrat candidate uh, for assembly to 667 around healthcare and his experience as a medical doctor. And he's uh, continuing to fight for healthcare and better services in Northwestern Wisconsin. Okay. Um, so I'm going to Northeastern Wisconsin now and uh, uh, the issue team of the year, uh, Scott Reef, who is a member of the, uh, of the movement politics team uh, for Northeastern Wisconsin. Scott is from Adel. I don't even know, I know it's in Northeast Wisconsin. Um, and, so he, uh, and so he is a, on a movement politics team and uh, played a big role in us endorsing strong progressives and in our support for co-op member Christina Shelton, who won an assembly district uh, in 90th and is already one of the most progressive members of the state assembly and of course a Northeast Wisconsin co-op member. And then from the Northeastern Wisconsin co-op, um, Ahmad uh, Rivera Wagner from Green Bay uh, for the Movement Politics Champion of the Year Award. Um, and Ahmad really stood out um, in, his, in, uh, in his work as an elected leader and, uh, and has de demonstrated a commitment to building crescent power and working closely with the uh, mayor of Green Bay, Eric Genrich, who is a member of Citizen Action of Wisconsin uh, Co-op, Northeastern Co-op. And Ahmad is uh, particularly a stalwart on um, the Equal Rights Ordinance uh, in Green Bay. So thank you very much, uh, Ahmad, for, for your tremendous work. Um, also from the Northeastern Wisconsin Co-op, uh, Renee Gash from De Pere, Wisconsin, issue of the year, um, issue team of the, of the year. Uh, and so uh, Renee um, is a member, as we said, of the Northeastern Wisconsin Co-op and uh, has played a big leadership role and played a big role in making sure we could endorse Christina Shelton in the primary. Uh, she won a contested primary. Um, and, uh, and, I'll, and also a huge number of other things that happened in the Northeastern Wisconsin Co-op back to the beginning and its founding. So thank you very much, Renee, uh, for what, you, what, you are, what you've been doing for years and what you continue to do. Uh, for the Northeastern Wisconsin Co-op, Mark Smith from Oconto Falls, um, issue team of the year uh, for, movement, for the movement politics team. Uh, Mark is a great, great rural activist and uh, played a big role in, in both uh, the endorsement process and making sure that we endorsed Christina Shelton and put on a strong effort to make sure she won the primary. Um, and the primary was the major campaign in the 90th Assembly District. It's a Democrat enough district that uh, the general election was not, was not the major fight, it was the primary. And I should say Citizen Action is one of the few groups that really played in primaries to try to make sure the Democratic delegation has more movement progressives. Um, in it that will actually seek bold structural reform. So also from the Northeastern Wisconsin Co-op, uh, Emma uh, Fuldweiler, um, Fold Wilder, Wilder, sorry, the two L's, I hope I didn't mispronounce it, Emma. Uh, Emma Fuldweiler, Wilder from Green Bay, issue of the year, uh, uh, she's an issue team of the year awardee and has played a big role um, in the Northeast Wisconsin Co-op and getting behind Christina Shelton. I see a theme here in the Northeastern Wisconsin Co-op that is a huge victory and uh, played a great, a great role in the, in the issue teams and the, uh, and, and the movement politics team in the Northeast. Um, and then also from the Northeast Wisconsin Co-op, um, Eliza, uh, Eliza Kazan from Green Bay, 
for issue team of the year. Um, and he is a member of the movement politics uh, team um, and has played a big role in that. And seeing a theme here played a big role in the contested primary that, that our member Christina Shelton won, who is now entering the state assembly in January. Uh, Casey Hicks, also from the Northeastern Wisconsin Co-op from De Pere Movement Builder Award. And uh, uh, Casey played an integral part in advancing uh, the local climate action plan in Green Bay. And as we'll talk about later, local climate plans are, are hugely important um, for, uh, uh, for citizen action and some of our coalition partners. And uh, Casey is a regional organizer for Wisconsin Conservation Voters, uh, really one of our core partners all over the state in getting uh, developing climate action plans. So thank you very much, Casey, uh, for your work. Also from the Northeast, um, Emily, uh, now I'm really got a problem pronouncing this, I really apologize. Uh, I'm gonna say it's Emily Cephas, uh, and the T is silent, uh, from Appleton, Wisconsin. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I botched that. Uh, movement, po uh, movement building award as well um, for, her, for her work on elections and uh, count every vote work, which of course was very important because there was a big effort to not count every vote, only count Republican votes as we know. Uh, from the Northeast, Cassandra Erickson uh, for, for the movement builder award. Um, I'm just gonna, cause we're gonna run out of time, uh, move through these because of the numbers we have. So I'm just gonna give the title of the award. Cassandra's from De Pere. Thank you for your work. Uh, Northside Rising uh, uh, Johnson, uh, Letitia Johnson um, is from Milwaukee. From the, and Northside Rising is our new organizing uh, co-op uh, in Milwaukee that is African American centered. It's officially launching this year. It's been building up, you know, doing the pre-build all of this year. And so thank you very much, uh, Leticia, for what you have been doing uh, for the, the new, our newest co-op. Uh, David Sinclair for the, uh, these are Shining Star, Northside Rising Shining Star Awards. Uh, David Sinclair from Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, for work on, uh, uh, with Northside Rising and did a whole ton of work. I have a whole, uh, a whole big block of text here. So thank you very much, David. And, uh, um, Elijah Anderson, Eli uh, uh, Alyssa Anderson, I apologize, Alyssa Anderson from Milwaukee, uh, the Northside Rising, Rising Volunteer in Progression Award. And so for the North Central Wisconsin Co-op, and we'll talk a lot more about Northside Rising in the rest of the agenda, uh, for the North Central, Tricia Zunker, needs no introduction, uh, member of the Wausau, uh, Wausau City Council who, um, who ran for Congress and is our member and put up a great race against who's gonna turn out to be one of the worst members of Congress, uh, Tom Tiffany. So thank you, Tricia, and you're still there in Wausau uh, and where we are building progressive power. From North Central, that's a Movement Politics Campaign Award, uh, Jeff Johnson, uh, North Central Wisconsin Community Leader of the Year, um, and he is from Wausau, Tricia is also from Wausau, and Melissa Schroeder from North Central Wisconsin, Dedicated Leader of the Year uh, for the North Central Wisconsin Co-op, and. Uh, uh, Melissa is from Merrill, and then Nancy Stencil from Wausau, Wisconsin, Volunteer of the Year uh, from the Northwestern Wisconsin, Central Wisconsin Co-op, and Nancy's been a fixture in the North Central Wisconsin Co-op since its founding, and a great volunteer, and I know is on the call. Uh, Sarah Watson from the North Central Wisconsin Co-op for Emerging Leader of the Year, um, and Dan Dunphy from North Central Wisconsin Co-op, from Merrill for the Decade Leader Award. Uh, Sarah Watson was from Wausau and Dad Dum Dumphy is from Wausau. And then we have from the so um, Southeastern Wisconsin Co-op, Dave Redeman, uh, the, who's the Steering Committee Member of the Year and has been a, a fixture and a volunteer and, and, and made a big contribution since the beginning of the Southeastern Wisconsin Co-op. And Marlene Ott is Steering Committee Member of the, War of the Year and Marlene is also on our education fund board, on our C3 board, and is a very well-known volunteer and strong supporter uh, in every possible way. So with that, I'm sorry that took a little longer than expected and got us, uh, got us a little bit behind, um, but we are going to go to our 2020 successes, and I'm gonna shorten what I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna hand it over to members of our team. Um, and so, I'll just say overall, I said this at the beginning, uh, 
with all of your volunteer work and the fact that we are truly statewide, Citizen Action has become uh, one of the most effective uh, organizations, not just in Wisconsin, in the country. And we're working on the huge issues that are extreme importance to progressives, guaranteeing healthcare as a right, getting true economic and racial justice and pairing that with the climate transition. We need to prevent what will be a genocide and which can create, since we have to reopen the economy to do it and restructure it, uh, a, a just equitable economy and deal with the legacy of structural racism and, and, and uh, gender discrimination, which you see still in the economic numbers, and a whole lot of other discrimination in our society and the unequal distribution of income where we've had a 50 trillion dollar transfer since the 70s from everyone else to the top 0.1 percent of american society by a rigging of the economy so we're going to re-rig it and so and we do elections you have to do elections and build power and get real uh, champions in there and then you have the capacity to work with them to build real change and i think that this state legislature it's incremental, but we have more champions, a lot more than we did uh, two years ago or four years ago or six years ago when we're on the road to creating what used to be, the Democratic Party in Wisconsin used to be, it used to be one of the most progressive Democratic parties in the country. It has not been that in the last decade, almost out of Stockholm syndrome because of Scott Walker and the Republican legislature. But really, we need to stand for something. And we, when, we, when elected, we need to actually achieve real change that, that changes people's lives. And so this is going to be an exciting legislative session. Lots of work to do. We're already flying into action on the state budget. And so this all fits together. It's a virtuous circle between this incredible election work to then the work of trying to do something with those mandates. And there, there's huge progress we can make now. And if we flip the legislature in new districts, and we have to make sure those districts are fair, big issue, then we can make even more progress by winning more races in 2022, and then really having a progressive renaissance. And I want to say that since we played a huge role in this close election and making sure that Wisconsin was actually won fair and square uh, by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that the platform they ran on is the most progressive since the 1940s, at least. Uh, you could argue about the 60s, but it's a very, very progressive platform. Nothing like this in the post-Watergate period. Now it's a question of actually doing it. And that's going to be very, very, that's, that's very, very hard work. And so we're also going to be, we're looking with people's action, working intently on where we can actually advance healthcare, where we can advance climate, where Biden is going to be extremely bold on climate, um, and a whole lot of other issues we, we know that we face. I mean, the, uh, the, the whole uh, social justice movement around George Floyd is something that we are increasingly uh, engaged in and figuring out how we actually get the structural reform, not just have a moment we recognize it's racist and then return to the way it was, which has unfortunately been the unfortunate pattern. So with that broad overview, I don't want to take away content from our directors. I want to hand it over to Claire Zoutke, our Healthcare for All director. Thanks, Robert. Um, that was a great intro, and I'm glad that the energy is so hyped. We are going to talk a little bit about all of the amazing things that we did in 2020 around healthcare and how that is setting us up for success in 2021. Um, so 2020 for us, um, of course, was all about two things, agenda setting so that we could be successful in the new Congress and in the new state legislature, and of course, reacting to COVID. So on the agenda setting level in 2020, um, we worked really hard to make sure that our healthcare priorities were going to be priorities in the elections at the state and federal level and so that we could advance those policies that we would be the people with power in this state to tell the legislature this is what we want you to work on to be telling congress this is what you need to be working on and these are the biggest issues in the election so for us those issues were things like badger care public option making sure people knew in the state of wisconsin that badger care expansion isn't enough we need a public option for people things like pharmaceutical reform. We can't just talk about making healthcare coverage more import, uh, more um, affordable. We also need to bring down the prices and the costs of prescription drugs for regular people. 
and we focused on setting or supporting caregivers, both family caregivers and direct care workers who come into people's homes and work in those nursing homes to take care of the most vulnerable members of our community. And so we made sure that legislators in the campaigns knew that like this is what we needed them to be working on. And at the federal level, we took on the mega power, the biggest lobbyists in this country, Big Pharma. We moved people like Ron Kind in Western Wisconsin to take on Big Pharma and to agree that we need to be breaking monopoly control over drug pricing and that we need to make sure the federal government knows that we expect them to be doing everything they can to bring down the prices of prescription drugs. And because of that, we are set up to a position of strength to actually accomplish those legislative goals in 2020. And of course, in support of COVID, we made sure that we knew that the state legislature and Governor Evers knew that we expected free testing and free treatment for COVID, including vaccines and hospital stays. And because of that, we were the first people to be calling for that in the state of Wisconsin. And because of that, Governor Evers has twice in two different bills over the course of the year included free treatment, medicines, and vaccines, and hospital stays in his legislation about how we are going to address COVID. So we were successful this year in setting the agenda of what people in the state and at the federal level we're going to be talking about when it comes to health care reform. And because of that, in 2021, we have set ourselves up for some big successes. And so we're going to be building upon that energy, building upon that agenda setting efforts by making sure that the legislature knows and that Governor Eber knows that in the state budget process, we want to see a Badger Care public option. We want people to be able to buy their health coverage through Badger Care. And this is one of our single biggest issues. It is the, probably the single biggest thing that we could do at the state level to increase affordability and equity in health care. And we are the leaders, the only people in the state who are, who are at the forefront of the fight for a Badger Care public option. We're also pushing the legislature and the governor to create a prescription drug affordability board that would review prescription drugs for price gouging and set limits on how much people should have to pay for those life-saving medicines. And we're pushing for higher wages and guaranteed health care for caregivers and more support for family caregivers. So you can see how all of the agenda setting stuff we did in 2020 has left us poised to be successful on these issues in 2021. And at the federal level, we are going to be pushing for family care. Expect in quarter one of 2021 that we're going to have a universal family care bill at the federal level that we're going to be pushing for. That includes universal child care, universal paid leave, and universal long-term care rights. And at the prescription drug level, we're going to be trying to pressure the Biden administration to break monopoly control over big pharma prices to negotiate, to to allow the federal government to negotiate to bring down pharmaceutical prices so drugs are cheaper and to guarantee that every person in America can receive a no cost COVID vaccine. We should not have to pay an exorbitant amount for a life saving vaccine that was funded with our tax dollars. And we most important, I think, are making already inroads with the incoming Biden administration to make sure that they are prioritizing healthcare and our healthcare demands. We are working with the Congressional Progressive Caucus, or the, yeah, the Congressional Progressive Caucus to develop and advance strong policies that will move us closer to our North Star vision of Medicare for All, including a robust federal level Medicaid or Medicare public option that is something that could actually happen in the next couple years and would be the single greatest advancement on a federal level towards universal single payer healthcare that we will have ever had in this country. And all of that is possible due to the power building progressive work that we did here in Wisconsin and with our partner organizations through people's action across this country. So we built power here. We set the agenda at both the state and federal level, and we are poised for some really great wins and successes in 2021. Give your, if you participate in any of our healthcare work, give yourself some snaps, give yourself some applause. We worked here. We crushed it. Thank you, Claire. And I mentioned our Green New Deal work, as we call it, or climate, racial, economic justice. And so 
Our first area where we built up a lot of capacity is in Milwaukee, where we're doing some really groundbreaking stuff and we are building an African-American base, which is absolutely essential if we're gonna have power. The white environmental base is not enough to get Milwaukee to change its whole st economic structure and policy in order to meet the climate disaster and also deal with the immense economic and racial inequality in our city and our region. And so I'm gonna turn it over to the, the leader of this campaign who has done a tremendous job, uh, Raphael Smith, our climate and equity director. So Rafi, take it away. How everybody doing out there? I know y'all can't really say anything, y'all on mute, but it's good to see everybody. Yeah, uh, thank you, Robert, for the introduction. Um, as you know, this has been a tough year, right? I mean, we're dealing with not only a pandemic, but a, a economic depression. And I, with all that being said, I think we've done an amazing job of accomplishing a lot of stuff. So give me one second as I pull up my, my slideshow my, and let's get started. So I really felt that this is just a couple of things. We accomplished so much, and this is just some of the highlights, I think, uh, that really showcase that how much work we've done. So first was the creation of the Joint City Task Force on Climate and Economic Equity. Now this came from um, Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee signing on to the Paris Accords goals, which is a 45 cut percent cut in emissions by 2030 and 100% renewable. 2050, right? Now, Milwaukee signed on to this in 2016. <clears throat> we really no plan in going into 2019. Uh, actually, how do you implement it? And coming out of a meeting with then Common Council President Ashanti Hamilton and Milwaukee County Supervisor and newly elected uh, State Assemblyman Supreme Moore Mukunde, they agreed to create this task force. And I'm not going to go into all the lists of organizations and members of this or of the task forces from the, over the region that either specialize in environmental work or equity work. And one of the first things we were asked to do as a task force, I'm a member, was to produce a preliminary report. We kind of outline of the status quo of the city in three key categories. Um, no, four, my fault, four key categories. Jobs and equity, emissions, finance, and education outreach. Now, how we divided ourselves was in, into work groups. And each work group was asked to produce findings, recommendations for the climate pl uh, cl climate planning process, excuse me, and short-term programs that if we had shovel-ready programs. So if we had funding uh, infused into the state that we can implement uh, right away. Now, when we came up with this plan, we didn't know what the, uh, the election was gonna produce, but I believe we have more friendly ground to actually get accomplished some of the things that we produce in report. And if you're interested, let me, let me see. Uh, I will put the preliminary report into the chat and you can read it. I say this humbly, but I really think this is the most comprehensive plan around climate and equity that the city has ever produced. And that's big, that's huge. Um, we also uh, was advocating in around May, June and July of this year for funding for transitional jobs program to be put into the uh, next recovery act. Uh, as you know, we were able to get a recovery act produced, but one thing we were really able to accomplish was a companion, identical companion bill in the house um, that is co-sponsored by Congresswoman Gwen Moore and Danny Davis. And just like uh, Claire talked about earlier, this is set against setting itself for success in 2021. Um, we have fr friendlier, uh, a friendlier landscape going into 2021, and I think we can actually really accomplish this, and that would be huge, right? Um, Robert talked about it. We launched Northside Rising. This has been amazing, um, a true joy in mine, and one of the biggest things I think we accomplished is hiring a, such a great lead organizer, Dana Kelly. She has led some amazing work. <clears throat> She's done an amazing job her leadership team, her coalition leadership team has done such amazing things within a, such a short period of time. And that leads me to my fifth point, the point, which is the extension of the utilities moratorium. And I'm going to go into the details, but able to accomplish that, I don't know, I can't overstate how impactful that was to working class people's lives. It was so important. And I'll let Dana talk about it because she and her team led the work, but they did such an amazing job and they really made a a tangible impact on people's lives, right? So 
that's some of the things we accomplished. We also did town halls, we did forums, we did a lot of amazing things, but under the circumstance, I think we accomplished so much. And you know, the work now, not only have we done in 2020, but 2019 has set us up for a big 2021. So I think the next question you will probably ask yourself, where are we going? Like, what is the next steps? And as Robert talked about earlier, we are heading into budget season. And we, as an organization, have five key demands that we are looking and advocating for to be put into the next state budget. And here they go. Uh, state should fund local climate action plans, similar to the one we are producing here in Milwaukee. State funding for a transitional jobs program for getting people into energy conservation and renewable energies program that cut emissions. This is very key when it comes to the equity piece, right? The government as an employer and getting providing people the skill set to later go into the private sector is the thing that's going to make the biggest impact and when it comes to equity. Um, to give consumer utility debt. I mean, this is self-evident, right? It's, it's ridiculous that we would even attempt to have people pay thousands of dollars um, when they had through no far their own, they're unemployed, right? So we just think it's so unjust that we even are attempting to do so. And I think this is a very key issue here, not just in Milwaukee, but across the state. Uh, utility mandates on own bill financing. I'm not gonna go into the minutia of what is own bill financing. The short and sweet is, the, uh, the utility fronts the money for upgrades in your home and you lower your bill, your monthly bill, while also paying off the upgrades that will lead to jobs, right? So the people who would do the upgrading hopefully comes from the most marginalized people in our community. If you want more information about that, you can reach out to me or your organizer and we can have a meeting around it or a conversation around it. And also to allow cities and uh, states and cities to raise the ability standards uh, for greenhouse mitigation. I mean, this is another self evident This is so important. The state currently has the ability to uh, control what the standards are. And we think that should be, you know, the within the wheelhouse of local municipalities. So, yeah. Um, so what can you do as a member? How can you get involved? Well, you can either join or create a local climate issue team with, within your co-op. If you don't have one, reach out to your co-op uh, organizer. I can't stress enough that this is a very key on actually getting anything done in your region. So if you don't have one, create one. Contact your state and local officials and advocate for a climate action plan. This gives you a good base to actually have start having conversation about what does your region need and what can you produce. Uh, you can hold a, a virtual house meeting dedicated specifically to the climate and get some of your closest friends to start having a conversation and building up. And also, you can sign up to be a climate spokesperson over the next couple of months. And uh, yeah, we will be having hearings and the governor will be having hearings and the JFC hearings and all that type of stuff. So if you want to tell your climate story, you can sign up to be a cl uh, climate spokesperson and reach out to your, your, uh, your organizer in your region. With that being said, I would love to bring up two members who are also members of the Milwaukee City County Task Force to talk about their experience on the task force. And that will be Ted Craig and Janet Meissner Pritchett. <coughs> How you doing, Janet? Oh, hey, Raphael. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, I don't know if Ted is around, but if we can get started. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would like to yeah. talk okay. about your experience on the task force, you know, um, and if you can talk about some of maybe some of the, your, not just your experience as a member of Citizen Action, but you remember your experience as a member of the task force and some of the accomplishments that the task force in Milwaukee has, uh, has produced. Yeah, well, I, first of all, I just do want to lift up um, Citizen Action and the leadership of um, Rafi and, and Robert and um, Supervisor Supreme Mora Mukunde, um, also with Ashanti Hamilton setting up the task force in the first place. You know, it was really a critical step. And um, it, it gives a, a more official platform now for the city to work on climate and equity. Um, it's been a really important commitment from the beginning to make equity really right up there as a joint and dual goal with climate, which is unique amongst um, local climate action plans. Um, it's not just an add-on. And it's been exciting, I think, as, as Rafi summarized, you know, what we achieved initially was the preliminary report, which was sort of a stock take that we did 
and sort of where does the city stand um, right now and, and what are some opportunities we have to go forward. Um, I think one important function of the, or, or um, impact that the city council ta task force has had is because it was jointly approved and ordained by the city council and the county board, I think it also strengthens um, the city and county staff people um, you know, the, both the city and county have staff people working on climate issues. Um, I think that the existence and the role that the climate task force can play can really help to strengthen their hand in doing their work and getting more resources and feeling that community support and wider mandates. So I think those are some of the key things. Challenges going ahead is really to make the wider community aware of, of the existence of the city county yes. board and its work. And I think that's where you all on this call, certainly those of you who are in Milwaukee County, um, can really play a role in joining with us. And I know, <clears throat> you know, Northside Rising and the Southeast Co-op will be involved with that. And I think there's an effort um, going forward. The task force is really going to be trying to build a plan to make its, its plan and its activities more concrete and engage the community in that. So I think that's going to be an exciting year going forward. Thank you, John. That's awesome. Ted, did you have anything you wanted to add? Sure. Um, I would just say, uh, I, I can't add a lot to what Janet said, but I would just say that about three years ago, um, our citizen action issue team decided to take on climate as a way to address economic inequality and the climate problem. And uh, not a lot was going on in 2017 in the city, um, even though, um, the, you know, for 30 years we've known that we're causing a catastrophe with greenhouse gas emissions. And for a lot longer than that, we've known that we have just intolerable inequality racially and discrimination against people with very little done about it that's been effective for years and years. And us, it was a natural to combine those. And I feel like um, there's been a lot of work, I wouldn't want to minimize it, but it's been kind of low hanging fruit at this point. We found that the Milwaukee Common Council was unanimously in support of what we wanted to do here as far as cutting greenhouse gas emissions and using the investments to improve uh, economic opportunity. And the county board voted something like 14 to two for it. And um, we've made progress like getting our first inventories of where the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. But I feel like we're gonna get to a point where push comes to shove where we need uh, real power to actually change things because we'll be running up against forces of the status quo um, that are very vested and we've got to build more and more of a, of, a, of a movement to overcome the obstacles that we're going to face. So I think we're really well positioned to do that, but we need more people to be involved. We need to be making more um, connections in the community and we need to be building power to do what we really need to do. You can just see it all over the force of the status quo, make it very easy to say we're for addressing climate change and racial inequality, but then it seems like nothing happens and that's for, for a reason. So um, it's been a great experience so far. I think it's gonna get really interesting as we go forward to actually um, seeing the money and seeing the policy and legal changes that are necessary to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and actually do something uh, very, very substantial to reduce the, the inequality and, and, and racism in our society. Ted, you are like a great point guard. You just set me up, gave me a assist, and I can get to do an awesome segue and ask you. Perfect. How, how can I get involved right now? Um, well, there are a couple different ways that people can be involved. One is that if you live in Milwaukee County, um, the task force is going to be setting about uh, really engaging and involving people in the community. And there'll be a lot of opportunities for people to get involved. There'll be multiple work groups that you can come and actually be part of. There'll be public hearings. There'll be a lot of ways that people can weigh in. And then the other major way is through Citizen Action, we have an issue team uh, that is dedicated to economic justice and addressing the climate catastrophe. And we need more people to be involved in that, uh, just to be reaching out and, and building power. So those are the primary two ways I can think of. Thank you, Ted. Janet, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, just to echo what, what um, Ted was saying, you know, it's all well and good, <clears throat> you know, the, it, I mean, it's great that the, the city and county um, elected representatives were so supportive of setting up the task for it, force, but so far we've largely just been sort of a volunteer sort of talking and analyzing things. But to get things done, we're going to have to really prioritize it, and that means prioritizing in terms of resources that are put toward it, and that's where push comes to shove, and that's where um, we're going to have to go back to those elected leaders and their constituents to say this is the priority that can really we need to. 
Well, thank you both. Y'all both are amazing, not just members, but human beings. And I look forward to working with you both over the next year to get accomplishing a, a real uh, climate action plan for the city of Mobile. So thank you both. If you're interested um, in the Milwaukee region, I will produce, um, I will not produce, I will put in the the document where you can sign up to be a part of a work group that Ted was talking about. So thank you both. And I will shoot it over to Robert, I believe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it immediately uh, to Matt Brust, Matt and Zoe to talk about our incredible election work. So we will get into other uh, programs when we get to the co-op reports later. So Matt, take it away. First of all, uh, thank you everyone. It's an honor to be here. Uh, this is amazing. And so it's, we've got more to report. Uh, first of all, just gonna say, we ran a historic election program in 2020. It was a historic year. Um, and I wanna thank everyone on this call, who, everyone on this who participated, both our members, our staff, uh, uh, folks, the, the relationships with People's Action, which is huge to have this national network who helps support a lot of what you're gonna hear about. Uh, our relationship with Progress North, North, which was highlighted, amazing work uh, that we were able to do. Want to say historic by any way you measure our program uh, this year. Any sort of tactical measure. Uh, we were involved in over 27 state legislative districts. You're going to hear more about uh, our significant Canvas program. But we did over a half a million calls, had over 41,000 conversations, serious conversations. You're gonna hear much more about that uh, from Zoe in just a minute. Uh, but also digital, we same folks we were having these conversations on the phones uh, and previously the doors, uh, we contacted digitally, we contacted through uh, a mail program that had nearly a, mail, a million mail pieces, uh, texting program uh, and additional phone programs. This was a huge volunteer program, hundreds of volunteers who participated both in the state, also hundreds of volunteers nationally who chipped in and helped in people's action. Our largest paid component, which you're about to hear more about. The thing I wanna close with is just say, this program is all premised on a program that we have been talking about at the annual meeting and building on for since the ashes of the 2016 election. And all I can say is uh, the key things around that was we were gonna invest in a platform, i.e. an agenda, long-term agenda, that was gonna get us focused on what our values are. We were also gonna recruit people to run for office, our members, invest in our members, try to get them to run for office, and the relationships and the people in our communities that we thought were critical to winning, i.e. we were gonna invest in women's leadership and women of color statewide, and we were gonna run election programs that were to scale. We've done that. The two big things we did this year, in, 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 in particular the last cycle, was invest, in that candidate recruitment program, you're gonna hear more from Joanna about that, but also run the largest field program we've ever run in the Deep Canvas. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Zoe uh, Roberts, who led that program as a member coming out of our uh, organizing co-op, uh, local elected official, uh, Zoe helped lead that program. Zoe Roberts, you take over and talk about the historic Deep Canvas. Thank you, Matt. Um, our, our program was a deep canvas program and for those of you that don't know, uh, deep canvassing is a little bit different than the traditional door knock that you get um, where you go out and you say, hey, Joe Biden's great, here's three or four facts and have a nice day. Um, deep canvassing is more about having a really, really tight one-on-one -on -one conversation with people, encouraging them to share stories with you and sharing stories with them sharing vulnerabilities with each other. And this is all done in an effort um, to, to get them to process their cognitive dissonance uh, around an issue or a candidate. Um, it's also the only known uh, way to actually cause a lasting impact on somebody's opinion of an issue or a candidate. Um, so that's, that's an impressive component. Um, this program also included a race class narrative that Dr. Craig alluded to earlier. Um, simply put, this, uh, this portion of the program was designed to make people confront their fears and their feelings about race and class. Um, it forced them to think about it and potentially talk about it in a way that they've never done before. 
So that's a difficult conversation to have with people. Um, so our team did a, a great job um, and they were amazing from top to bottom. Um, and I'll get into some numbers here in a moment. Um, the, way that, the way the program it was intended to work is that we started out on an issue, uh, in most cases, healthcare. And then we did a second pass through the same, the same people um, with a uh, candidate-based script and supported candidates uh, directly. So it was a really neat program. Um, it had some very impactful and meaningful, um, we had so many great conversations that were impactful and meaningful long-term, I think. Um, this is the way to go forward uh, with canvassing. It's, it, it's the way to change people's minds. Um, shout out first to the field team. These people were amazing. At our peak, we had 53 people from both Citizen Action of Wisconsin and Progress North making phone calls. Um, they did an amazing job on the phones. This was, this was intended to be a door knocking program that we had to move to the, to the phones because of COVID-19. Um, so all of their hard work, uh, I, I, can't, I can't say enough. It, it was an amazing program and these people were like family because of how tight we became. Um, I can't, I can't, I would be remiss if I didn't mention people's action who, who Matt and uh, Dr. Craig have alluded to. Without their training and support, um, I don't know that we would have been able to run this effective of a program because I don't think that we would have had the resources or the knowledge base to do it. So kudos to them. They did a great job helping us. Um, going all the way back to <laughs> exotic Tomo, Wisconsin in last, last February for our initial training. Um, that was a cool experience and thank you so much. Um, as far as the numbers go, this team accounted for 335,239 dials and we had 15,510 completed quality conversations. Um, these completed quality conversations are the ones that actually wind up probably moving people. So this was an incredible statistic. So that was great and it helped us turn Wisconsin blue. Now when we combine that with the People's Action Volunteer Program, um, that accounts for <laughs> 515,151 dials, 3,187,013 texts, and a total of 27,028 uh, quality voter conversations where we potentially moved people and changed people's minds. And with that, I'll hand it off to Joanna. Thank you, Zoe. That was amazing uh, recap of the work that we've been doing uh, this past election cycle. Um, I am, so I'm Joanna, I'm based in Milwaukee and I'm the Movement Politics Director at Citizen Action of Wisconsin. Uh, thank you, I was just gonna ask one of my colleagues if you can put the spotlight on me. And so we've been talking a lot this year about movement politics and co-governing and what that looks like. Um, if you joined us uh, at our fundraiser a few weeks ago, uh, you'll, you'll have heard me talk a lot about this work and this program. Um, and then also if you've just uh, participated in, in any of our events throughout the 2020 year, um, you'll have seen uh, our kind of our examples and um, the way we are um, leading and co-governing and, and trying to make this work a reality. So I'm just going to jump into um, our panel discussion since we're behind and I want to be mindful of our newly elected representative time. Um, so again, I'm going to ask my colleagues to help me out if we can hit, uh, put some spotlight on our guests. Uh, Representative-elect Supreme Moore Amakunde, Representative-elect Lee Snodgrass, Representative-elect Christina Shelton, and Representative-elect Sarah Rodriguez. Um, these are our four special guests that I'm so excited to have uh, join us this Saturday morning. Um, thank you all for your patience. I want to start with just uh, letting you all do a quick intro of yourself. So uh, Lee's the first person that popped up on my screen. So let's start there. Lee, if you can unmute yourself and just introduce yourself to the Citizen Action member. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for letting us uh, join you this morning. Um, my name is Lee Snodgrass and I am the newly elected representative for the 57th Assembly District. I will be taking over for Representative Amanda Stuck who's held the seat for uh, six years, finishing off her sixth year. Um, 
We have a really great opportunity in the 57th. Before Amanda, it was held by Penny Bernard Shaver, and I really ran on leaning into the fact that we have a, a history of a strong voice, progressive woman in the seat. Uh, so I'm happy we were able to, to keep, that, keep that in place. Um, also, I am the first LGBTQ plus uh, representative of the district. Um, I'm an out by woman and I'm very proud to represent that community as well in this role. Um, I just wanted to say a couple words about citizen action. Uh, I ran in 2018 as well for state Senate. And one of the things that I really appreciate as a candidate, um, you know, you have a lot to learn and there's a lot coming at you really, really fast. And um, a reliable source for information, how legislation in your district will impact um, the people in your district, um, you know, really digging deep in some of the issues is the work that Citizen Action really does that really truly helps support candidates like me. Um, we had the tools at our fingertips to be able to intelligently talk about everything from healthcare to racial justice issues to climate issues. Um, and they're always, always available for us to ask questions and support us if we are working on something, whether it be a panel or a speech or talking points. Um, so Citizen Action really plays, I think, a very instrumental role in making sure that progressive politicians actually have the facts and figures that they're going to need to talk about issues and move that needle. So I uh, wanted to thank everybody for that in advance. And thank you again for having me here. Thank you, Lee. As an openly out by woman myself, I am so proud to see you lead with pride. And thank you for your leadership. Uh, let's welcome Supreme. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Supreme Moore Mukunde. Um, it's really, really good to be here, as always. Um, so when I ran, I also ran two years ago in 2018 um, unsuccessfully. However, uh, this time, what I wanted to do, I wanted to make sure that we were leaning into some of the issues that we had been working on. Um, for the past two years. Citizen Action was very instrumental in some of the issues that we talked about dealing with the city county task force on climate and economic equity and achieve, achieving climate justice. Also talking about healthcare, expansion of healthcare, especially during COVID-19, where you have uh, uh, pockets of the, of the community, especially in the district that I represent, uh, where it was just exponential uh, COVID cases. And also having the one uh, hospital on the north side that was attempting to shutter its doors for greener pastures um, in, in suburbs. I wanted to make sure that we were keeping that space in our city. And also just talking about getting some of our local money, uh, keeping it closer to home and talking about a race class narrative um, as we talked about local and state politics. And so um, I'm also a community organizer. I'm also a county board supervisor for the next two weeks. And, um, and it was just really great to have the support of organizations like Citizen Action and some of the work that we're doing um, here in, uh, in the city of Milwaukee and the state of Wisconsin. Thank you, Supreme. And I wanna bring on Christina Shelton. Hey everyone, thanks for having me today. Uh, this is such a fantastic way to spend my Saturday. Congrats to all the award winners and to all of the work that you all have accomplished. Um, it is an incredible body of work and to hear it all allows us to really amplify and celebrate. Uh, I think it's really important that we do that with one another and for one another. Um, and let me also say thank you to Citizen Action. I would not be here uh, getting ready to, uh, you know, step into uh, this assembly, you know, leadership role without Citizen Action. You all unapologetically had my back from the beginning. Um, you came out for me. You were the first organization to endorse me. I remember the day. I get teary when I think about it because it meant so much to me. You know, when we started this primary, we didn't know what was going to happen. We were running against uh, the current elected, who is a Democrat. Uh, that's a difficult thing to, to take on. And you all demonstrated the tremendous amount of political courage to, to stand with me and to, you know, take that on. And I know that, you know, there was some backlash on that as well. So my support words and, and my action could never um, tell you how much uh, I appreciate that because it really did transform my life and it transformed my campaign. Um, you know, the 90th is, is like so many urban areas uh, changing. In June, we had the largest demonstration in the history of Green Bay for Black Lives Matter. And I want that, I want to sit that with everyone for a few minutes and really think about what that means. Um, our campaign was unapologetic and running a big, bold, courageous, progressive agenda. We came out of the gate and we talked about 
badger care expansion. We talked about the importance of black lives. We talked about intersectionality. I talked a lot about a state level Green New Deal um, and living wage jobs and union for all. And we just came out and were very clear about where we stood. And I think that the outcome of the election shows that not only the 90th, but the state of Wisconsin is ready for this, this bold, courageous vision for a progressive movement that is backed up by really strong policy and legislative action. So thank you to everyone. Thanks to Joanna. Um, I'm so excited to continue to work with each of you and to get to know you more. And uh, yeah, thanks for everything that you do. Thank you, Christina. Yes, I love reflecting on how early we started working on your race in the primary. Um, and, and I'll still remember the first day we met in that coffee shop in Green Bay. Um, what a great uh, time it's been during the campaign and, and looking forward to all of the great things we're gonna do with you as an elected leader. All right, let's bring on Sarah Rodriguez. Sarah, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Sarah Rodriguez, and I actually flipped a district this cycle with the help of Citizen Action, so thank you very much. District 13, which includes um, Brookfield, Elm Grove, Wauwatosa, West Dallas, and a little bit of Milwaukee. And we um, flipped it from an eight year in Republican incumbent. And so now we have another set of hands um, against really bad, like the wall of really bad legislation that sometimes comes out of the, the assembly. And um, we're able to save the governor's veto powers, which I think is gonna be really important. A little bit about me. Um, I think many of you know, I was not planning on running in this race. I'm a registered nurse. I have a strong public health background. And I decided to run when the Republicans decided to put political power over the health of our constituents in the spring election. It was so disappointing to me that um, it is just a basic tenet of governing that we should keep the health of our citizens primary and first. And that was not what happened in, in the spring election. It was so disappointing. Um, you know, I am a former epidemic intelligence service officer with the Centers for Disease Control, did national and international outbreak investigations, helped run the mass vaccination campaign in, in Colorado when I worked in public health there. And so I know what it's going to take for that federal and state partnership to really get a hold of COVID um, within Wisconsin and we're struggling today. And if that COVID legislation that just came out from the Republican led legislature is any indication it is not only cruel, it is dangerous. And we need to have bigger and better conversations about how we keep our citizens and, and, and other people safe within, the, within, within Wisconsin. Um, I am so excited to serve. I am so excited to have a, you know, a Democrat um, in the 13th district. And I actually live in Waukesha County which um, is we haven't had a Democrat representing, living in, in Waukesha County for quite some time, and you know, decades, I think. And so this is just a time um, to have, you know, more progressive voices within uh, areas that are changing. And I think it's gonna be exciting as we, as we move forward. So thank you again for all of your support. And I just, I can't wait to start on January 4th. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you. Everyone, Christina, Lee, uh, Supreme, um, we are so grateful for your leadership, grateful for the relationship that we have with you. Uh, you know, all of you alluded to the way we work together at Citizen Action and you all on your campaigns. Um, and we know that movement politics transforms into movement governing, right? And so this whole time we've been on um, our annual meeting, we've been talking about um, some of our focuses for the budget, right? Like that's the next step is pushing for our 2021-2022 legislative budget. And uh, our big focus is healthcare and climate equity and a Green New Deal. Um, and so I just kind of want to get your thoughts um, briefly. I know we're running short on time, so just kind of want your thoughts on our efforts and how we can actually be in this co-governing relationship. How can um, we work together? So uh, the two biggest things um, under healthcare is, so we are obviously um, facing a, a basically an affordability crisis, right? Like folks can't afford healthcare. We've seen a lot of people, you know, historic numbers of people lose their medical insurance um, because of COVID. Um, so one of our huge pushes, um, um, and, you know, obviously keep, like Claire said, wanting to keep the conversation around um, Badger Care expansion, but also want to push harder, right, 
for um, badger care as a public option. Um, and then also uh, this idea of a you know, prescription drug affordability board. And we've seen it done in other cities and states. Um, and so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to bring that home to Wisconsin. So just kind of want to have your thoughts around that first issue. And I'm going to start with Lee, just because I think we're only going to be able to get her for this one question because she's got to get going. Um, so uh, thank you again for being flexible with your time. Um, so get, take it away, Lee, if you just want to share some thoughts on that. Hi, everybody. I apologize at 1145. I have to hop off to get to a noon uh, commitment. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of the very unique position <clears throat> that we are in right now for healthcare, um, and it's, it's um, I hesitate to say it, but it's truly the, the only silver lining of the COVID pandemic, is that if you think back to previous election cycles, when we were talking about a public option, when we were talking about Badger Care for All, it was still, still seen, in fact, even by a number of, I would say, moderate Democrats as a bit of a fringe issue, a bit of a step too far. Um, well, guess what happens in the middle of a health pandemic when so many people have seen their, um, their, their health care security, their ability to have affordable health care through health insurance through their employer, um, there's a lot of vulnerability now in terms of people ha experiencing job loss or even experiencing, um, you know, what they anticipate is job loss in the future. So people are very, very open to that conversation now to have a health care option that is not tied to employment. And I think that this is a real opportunity for us as organizers to capitalize on that, to really highlight that connection and how by providing this option um, from a state standpoint, um, we, we, can, we can bring people out of that period of vulnerability, out of that, um, that fear uh, of not having health care at a time when, oh my gosh, we need health care more than ever because who knows uh, what will happen if we contract COVID um, or what will happen if, if the hospitals are full and cannot, um, cannot serve us if we have some other health care needs. So for me, that's a really important part of this conversation is that we make sure that we are making that connection for people because I have found when we do start to make that connection and have that conversation, you can almost literally see the light bulb go on and people saying, yeah, I never thought of it that way. I really am in a vulnerable position right now and that would be great to have a public option. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, yeah, we ourselves have been seeing, uh, you know, lots of in-state polling that Wisconsinites want this. They want to see this um, happen. Um, so thank you for that. Sarah, uh, can we bring you back on to, to give your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I wanted to mention, which I, I, mean, I, I believe many of you know this all already, but Wisconsin is the only state that expanded um, Medicaid without getting the federal support. The only state in the entire country that, exp that had some Medicaid expansion without getting federal support. So we are leaving millions and millions and millions of dollars on the table. We don't have a gap today. Um, in terms of who would be covered rather, you know, within the exchange versus on, on Medicaid. And so to be able to, um, A, number one, I know that's like sort of a first step, is just to get some of those federal dollars back within, within Wisconsin today is going to be important. Um, that will help our budget. We're going to have issues with the budget as we come up, you know, with COVID. That is a, a very simple message that we can have. And then as we move forward, that is not sufficient. We really need to be able to expand it even further. And there are a lot of other things that come with that in terms of access. And so I know um, individuals that you know, have Medicaid today that have difficulty getting into their provider. So what are we gonna need to do? So if we're gonna expand access for Medicaid, then we also have to look at um, access of providers and really make sure that people can get the care that they need. Um, secondly, um, I own my own business. And when I was trying to put my business plan together, I had to look to see how much it was going to cost me if I needed to cover my family for healthcare. And it is extraordinarily expensive if you do not have any sort of subsidies coming in. And so this is an argument we can make. We want to have entrepreneurs within Wisconsin. We want to have people that have really great ideas and want to put that out into the marketplace. And what is holding them back? but some of these expenses to be able to actually afford to cover their families. So I think there's a lot of arguments that we can make and, and things that would really um, look at the larger population within Wisconsin to make sure we have not just coverage, but actual care 
And that's the difference between the two. Um, if you have health insurance that you cannot access, if you can't find a provider that you need, you really don't have health care. So those are the kind of conversations that I think we can have moving forward. Thank you, Sarah. And just for things to flow, how about we bring Supreme on and then right after that, Christina, if you can jump in. Sure. So um, when it comes to health care, uh, I think it's really important. Um, I want to echo some of the things that uh, my colleague from the future colleague from the 57th talked about and um, just talking about health care expansion. This was the number one issue on the ballot two cycles straight. And so we need to continue to talk about health care. And also, um, everyone who did want to talk about health care expansion don't want to talk about Medicare for all. We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. And so now is the perfect time to be having that conversation. And we can lean on all of the work that other people have been doing all this time uh, with Medicare for all, with health care expansion, badge and care option, et cetera. Um, and it's really important that those on the ground are creating that groundswell and creating that demand for those at the state level and at the federal level as well. Um, I would encourage you uh, to make sure you're getting in contact with any healthcare organizers that are getting, trying to get you to join any groups or committees that would put pressure on uh, state elected officials during the, the, uh, the, the Joint Finance Committee's roadshow coming up, however it appears virtually, et cetera, to make sure that we can talk about you know, our prescription board, that we can talk about public option, that we can talk about supporting some of our local care workers, um, et cetera. Uh, we have to create the groundswell because we don't want anyone coming up to us and saying, you're talking about this healthcare expansion. Nobody's talking to me about it. Nobody's beating down my door. We want to beat down doors. We want to blow up emails and phones, et cetera. So I'm encouraging folks on the ground who know everyday pressures of what it's like to not be covered, to be undercovered, uh, or to want to have friends who are not covered or undercover covered. And you know those stories, so I'm encouraging you to tell those stories so that we can use them as a battery in our back as we make this fight in Madison. Joanne, do you want, do you want, to, you want me to go next? Okay. Yeah, I mean, how do I wrap that all that up? I mean, I agree with everything each of you said. Lee, I love how you described it. You said as organizers, not as at electeds. And I love that you said that. And I think that if we remember that and we really attack these issues from that perspective, that's how we change. That's how we revolutionize this, right? When we all center our values on that healthcare is a human right, we can then build solidarity out from, from, from that center vision because this is not something that we we, we don't use or we, we all use it. We all need it from birth to the end of life, right? And to me, this also connects to our economic security and our economic rights. We cannot be free, right? And we can't access, you know, the, the rights that we have been promised as Americans and Wisconsinites if we are being beholden to a lack of access or a lack of affordability because of the broken system through which we're trying to navigate. You know, as a, as a school board member, I see the lack of access um, in Green Bay with our students that we serve. You know, the school district has stepped up and has done tremendous work to provide, you know, um, dental programming and access and eye care and, you know, vision and hearing. And we now have, you know, community schools that has, you know, physicians and nurses in, 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 the, in the school buildings. And that is all wonderful but it's a stopgap to a much larger issue that we need to be ensuring that everyone has access to these to these services. Um, and it's, you know, from a preventative side, it saves us money in the long term. So I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, in, I'm really inspired by this because it's great to, to hear everybody really think broadly that we need to value people over profit. And uh, if we can center our values on that, I'm, I think we will we'll be successful. Absolutely. Absolutely, Christina. Thank you so much for doing that wrap up. And I, you know, I just want to again, thank you all for being here. We're running short on time and can't get to some of the other questions we had. Um, but just your responses talking about healthcare really has put me in a place where we're going to be able to get a lot of things done. <laughs> you know, part of the battle is getting our movement leaders elected, right? Like, 
getting our regular people, getting organizers, getting the folks that have been on the ground that are doing this work into elected office so that we can see the change that reflects the values of everyday regular Wisconsinites. And we see that in you all. Um, and so just grateful for the time that you all have put in put into your campaigns and so grateful that you, you took the step to run for office. Um, and we at Citizen Action are looking forward to continuing to work together to move these um, issues and these concerns to beyond the budget and into real action um, and to um, really see change for us. So I just wanna thank you all again. Uh, we're gonna wrap things up now. Um, wanna see if you either, any of you have anything else to add, anything you, anything you wanna close with, otherwise we are gonna move to the next segment. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Apologize for being uh, uh, late with the time, um, but I am gonna send it back to our executive director, Robert Craig. Thank you all. That was fantastic and that's why we do the work. And we cut short, there were other big issues we we're gonna talk about, but we're a train that's gonna to try to make up ground now. So before I transition to our next exciting sec sec segment where we are gonna take a tour of the organizing co-ops around the state, kind of like the Democratic National Convention with the nomination of the president. Um, couple quick shout outs. Uh, Melody McCurtis, the uh, Deputy Director of um, Medcalf uh, Community Bridges has joined us. So we honored you earlier in your organization. So thank you very much. And I'd be remiss for not mentioning uh, the leaders of our great boards of directors. So we have two presidents, board chairs, Mark Thompson and Stephanie Bloomingdale, two vice presidents, Candace Alley and Martha Love, and two great treasurers in uh, Guy Costello and Patty Yunk. So thank you very much. We have very active boards. We do not have rubber stamp boards. We have the opposite. We wouldn't have it any other way. So with that, we are going to take a tour of the co-ops and uh, of the organizing co-ops. And we are going to and try to stay on time, everyone. We're going to start with the North Central Wisconsin Co-op. And I have uh, uh, Rita, Rita is going to uh, give this uh, update. So thank you very much, Rita. Great to see you. Oh, thank you, Robert. This has been a very exciting uh, meeting and I'm so glad to be part of it. Uh, with the very capable leadership of Joel Lewis, the North Central Wisconsin Co-op has uh, accomplished lots in 2020. Uh, first of all, members and staff from the North Central Wisconsin and the Driftless Co-op worked with the Citizen Action of Wisconsin Co-op Development Director to implement the Green Homes Union Jobs Campaign. This is the result of years of work that eventually led to green energy refinance, refinance loans becoming available to homeowners with 15 or 30 year mortgages who are interested in refinancing their mortgage while also bundling in solar panels and other home energy upgrades. All homeowners can take advantage of this, but those with 15 and 30 year mortgages are the ones who are most likely to see monthly savings on their energy bill. That outweighs the cost of a home energy upgrade. As of today, 12 people have already signed up. <clears throat> Members of the North Central Organizing Co-op were involved in every level of the 7th CD special election that happened as a result of former U.S. Representative Sean Duffy stepping down from his post prematurely. North Central Wisconsin Co-op member and community leader Tricia Zunker stepped up to run for the seat, both in the special election and on the general election. Co-op members were involved in helping her to announce her campaign in uh, campaign promotion and in volunteering. The North Central Wisconsin Campaign Co-op and the Western Wisconsin Co-op worked in coalition to develop and implement a people's forum in Wassa and Rice Lake as Trisha faced a primary opponent named Lawrence Dale. These were member-led forums with questions based on the CAW movement politics platform. The North Central Organizing Co-op members worked in coalition with Fair Maps Wisconsin and the Fair Map Coalition to continue the pursuit of getting counties and municipalities to pass Fair Maps resolutions and or referendums. 
The greatest achievement of this coalition was getting the Marathon County Board of Supervisors to pass a fair maps resolution by a 19 to 17 vote. This has been attempted in 2018, but was indefinitely tabled during that administration. By 2020, several county board seats had been flipped, thanks in part to the North Central Co-op members working in coalition with a candidate committee in Marathon County to get new people elected. This is why the resolution was able to pass and illustrates the importance of our movement, politics work, and co-government. The North Central Organizing Co-op by way of the Citizen Action of Wisconsin Education Fund worked in coalition with the AAUW, American Association of University Women, to hold a, women, a people's forum with former WASA Mayor Robert Milkey and newly elected Mayor Katie Ro Rosenberg at UWO Stevens Point, WASA. Members helped to develop the program and the questions. The event was so well attended that an overflow room had to be created for people to view it live on WASA public uh, access. Mayor Rosenberg, whom we are lucky to call a co-op member, ultimately won that election. North Central Wisconsin Co-op members and friends worked in coalition with the Unitarian Universalists, the vote, and the League of Women Voters to do voter registration events in Wausau and Rhinelander who, prior to the stay-at-home orders. The North Central uh, Steering Committee approved endorsing 17 candidates for the local spring elections. 15 of these candidates won their races and another was eventually appointed to the Marathon County Board of Supervisors after the election. For the fair, for the fall elections, the North Central Wisconsin endorsed nine candidates in state legislative races, in addition to Trisha Zunker for the seventh CD. 38 members, allies, volunteered by writing postcards, doing um, contactless lit drops, and texting and or phone calling. Uh, it was a busy, busy time. And thank you, Joel, for organizing us all. Thank you very much, Rita, and great to see you on video. <laughs> uh, so, by the way, the Mayor, Mayor Rosenberg of Wausau is a co-op member, and we're beginning to talk to her about climate issues. Now, we're going to move to another part of the state, the Northeast Wisconsin Co-op. Uh, so Eliza is going to give the um, give the update. So thank you very much. Take it away. Uh, yes, thank you, Robert, for having me um, and running this fantastic meeting. It is just really nice to see you all and spend a Saturday with you. Um, I'm Eliza Cousin. She hers. Um, I am a organizer and campaign specialist here in Green Bay. You might know me as the campaign director for Christina Shelton for Assembly. Um, I did not take a vote on that endorsement, I should say. Um, but we're very thrilled um, to, to have all of you here. Um, so I want to acknowledge, you know, um, as activists, we cannot isolate ourselves from the world around us. And all these issues that we campaign on, that we lobby on, that we have conversations about in our communities affect us. Climate change, healthcare, all of these issues are personal to us. And that has made 2020 a particularly tough year. And I want to just reach out to everyone in the Northeast Co-op and around the state for striving through this year and achieving so much. I wouldn't begrudge anyone who said I need to step back from activism this year to take care of myself and my family. That is absolutely valid and fine. And the fact that all of us didn't do that and instead we opted to build power and make change is just incredible. Um, I also want to, of course, thank our fearless leader of the North, Noah Reef, um, who I think the word is unflinching. Um, she never backs away from a fight. She holds the line and really represents um, what leadership in a democracy should look like. Um, and 
props to her from moving, you know, across the state from one co-op to another without skipping a beat. We, we owe her great thanks. Um, so just to go into this a little bit, and I will rush a little bit to make sure that we finish on time and everyone gets their chance. Um, so our co-op members have stepped up to be leaders, um, not just in our communities, but across the state. Um, members have run for office, pushed local officials to adopt progressive policies in our region, and dedicated to electing working class champions up and down the ballot. Um, in particular, it was a history making year in Green Bay. Um, you know, even at the local city level, um, with the support of the leadership of co-op members, the city of Green Bay took huge steps in the progressive direction. So just in the last nine months, um, under Mayor Eric Genrick, uh, we have created our first Equality Commission. We've banned weapons from polling places on election day and administered the most robust and transparent election in recent Green Bay memory. Not to be outdone, the Green Bay School Board committed to creating an ambitious district-wide climate action plan. This plan commits to the district fully powering district buildings with clean energy by 2050. Just because we could not pack into city halls and county board chambers, our advocacy did not stop. In the month of July alone, co-op members and fellow Northeast Wisconsin residents sent out over 500 communications to local elected officials, asking them to strengthen their own public health policies on masking. Our region passed masking policies in Green Bay and Appleton in mid-July, ahead of the governor's own statewide policy. And I think that's a really good example of how increasingly the Northeast can be a bastion for progressive policies. And we have leaders like Christina and Lee really showing that, that you can run on a progressive platform, you know, in line with Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Elizabeth Warren and win big in this part of the state. Uh, like everyone else, we worked tirelessly to elect a slate of working class champions on November 3rd. Thanks to the members of our movement politics team, we built our power through our membership who, who ran for office. From endorsing strong member candidates in the spring to being the first organization to endorse Christina Shelton in her contested and extremely tough primary for the 90th Assembly District. Our team has answered the call time and time again. Our members created a culture of accountability and intentionality within our movement politics program. Over a dozen co-op members worked as election administrators, poll workers, or election observers across Northeast Wisconsin. These election heroes put their own health and well-being at risk so that all communities could safely exercise their democratic rights. As the outgoing president attempted to cast doubt on our democratic values, our members and newly elected champions stood together and demonstrated that every single vote counted. All of us co-op members contributed to our shared victories this year. We showed up to late night Zoom parties and meetings, socially distant rallies, virtual phone banks um, to go all in. This is so much there is so much more to come for our co-op in 2021. And with the learning curve of virtual organizing and having to do everything online, I think we are so much more skilled. We are so much more agile and adaptive and there is nothing stopping us from achieving our policy goals in the next year. So thank you everyone and thank you, Noah. That's great. Thank you very much. That's exciting. And we're handing it over now to our newest co-op that is going to officially launch this year, but it's already building power and gain victories this year. And Dana Kelly is now post-election full-time permit organizer for Northside Rising. And knock on wood, she'll soon be joined by a health equity organizer who'll be working within Northside Rising. So Dana, kicking it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, for such an awesome introduction and just such an awesome um, event today. It's been wonderful um, just to see how um, being a part of such a great organization has truly impacted not only our region, but our entire state. 
Um, I'm just going to briefly um, give a couple snapshots of what Northside Rising has done over this past year. Uh, actually, I will even say uh, six months. <laughs> we started, we did our launch party um, June 12th of 2020. And then after the launch party, uh, Ju uh, July 15th, we did our uh, green, uh, Good Green Jobs Rally, which also turned into a march to We Energies. Um, from that march, um, we got our first utilities moratorium extension on um, July 23rd. Um, actually, July 22nd, we had our second march. So we went right one week after um, to We Energies and we, we told them what we demand and uh, want to see, but found out through that process that we really needed to be talking to the PSC. So then after that, on July 30th, we began uh, Keep the Lights On and a Shed Some Light campaign. And that's where we started also a letter writing campaign um, to the PSC. We did um, a letter writing campaign, a banner drop, and a night out to keep the lights on during um, August and September. We also, September 1st, did a, a protest with the Milwaukee Autonomous Tenants Union at Barada Properties um, to extend the um, rent mor uh, moratorium, evictions moratorium, I'm sorry. And that was September 1st of 2020. Um, not saying necessarily that our protest made the CDC make this move, but the very next day on uh, September 2nd, the CDC um, did a national eviction uh, mor moratorium, which was implemented um, until December 31st. Um, so uh, after that, on uh, September 17th, we had our second utilities moratorium extension. This extension extended the, um, the utilities moratorium for uh, electricity and for water until uh, April 17th. I'm sorry, April 15th of 2021. Um, this affected 77 71,000 utility customers and 17,000 water um, uh, customers. We also found out that there is no um, winter moratorium for water utilities, but because of uh, the issues with COVID, um, that moratorium has been implemented as well. So that's another success. Um, then uh, October 4th, we did a March in Madison for Medicare for All, where we could, uh, connected with the Poor People's Campaign um, and a lot of other um, great coalitions that are working uh, to take um, away profit over the people in, um, in our healthcare system. Um, and then we had a PSL, uh, a Party for Socialism and Liberalism uh, rally against racism October 10th. Um, 2020. That's where Letitia Johnson and David Sinclair uh, spoke at this rally so eloquently, so powerfully um, about the uh, work of the collective and how important it is uh, for us to all help each other in this fight. Um, we did a, the, we were uh, very um, helpful in the defending democracy and election protection um, um, event on, on election day, November 3rd. And we are currently um, working on a debt cancellation and job creation through the Green New Deal. The debt cancellation um, is, is um, the byproduct of extending the utilities moratorium um, and the evictions moratorium, because now that um, the moratorium has been extended, debts are being increased and accrued. So now we are looking for total debt cancellation, not forgiveness, because we don't need to be forgiven for anything because we didn't do anything wrong, but we need these debts canceled because it is the right thing to do. Cre creating green jobs, um, we are looking to get that implemented through on-bill financing. Uh, Raphael kind of gave a little insight about what on-bill financing is.
us, but what we know that it will do is create and generate jobs, good green jobs, living wage jobs in the uh, community of color. It will also um, combat uh, health issues as far as particulate matter getting into um, our homes through windows, unsealed windows and doors. It'll also um, decrease greenhouse emissions by the installation of um, solar panel and things like that that, is, that are going to uh, re um, convert, I'm sorry, from, um, from, from fossil fuels to uh, more cleaner energy sources. Um, this is going to increase the health and the wealth of people of color, especially on the community, um, uh, on the north side community, because there are more renters on the north side than there are homeowners. So for the utilities company to spearhead and front the bill would be a benefit and a blessing to the community of color. It'll, it will uh, save money in our pockets It'll decrease our um, utility uh, rate, our utility bills monthly, and it'll also decrease our need for um, health care due to um, respiratory issues that we suffer on our uh, disproportionately on the north side in the, uh, the urban community. So building a community through engagement and collaboration, Northside Rising has built a base through grassroots outreach and engagement by hosting one-on-ones, house meetings, and open houses virtually, as well as developing grass top relationships with organizations and independent affiliates like Sunrise Milwaukee, Vecinos and Needles, the Poor People's Campaign, Milwaukee Autonomous Tennis Union, Milwaukee Water Commons, the Sierra Club, 350.org, the African American Roundtable, Liberate Milwaukee, The Block, and Clean Air po uh, Power Coalition. That's just to name a few. Although it's been a challenging year due to COVID, we have faced uh, every obstacle and overcome each adversity rising above everyone's expectation. Northside Rising is on the move and we keep rising to the top. Thank you all for all of your work, especially our volunteers. We have quite a few of our Do Some team on the call today. They've been on the call all, all morning, and they are the reason that we have been so successful. But I do want to shout out really quickly our, um, our um, those that were recognized today, Letitia, David, and Alyssa. Um, they have truly, truly made the work of, of Northside Rising phenomenal and have really made my work easy. Charles Bissinger is also on the line. He is phenomenal in his um, in, in implementing and, and bringing information for um, industrial um, green industrial jobs. So he's he's working on our projects, um, our shovel ready projects. And so he's actually going to be our next rising star because once we get the funding, the things that he has brought to the table, oh my God, you guys, 2021 is going to be great. So we are wanting to go green so we can see green. Thank you all again for all that you have done. And thank you again, uh, Citizen Action, just for this opportunity. Thank you, you, Thank you, Dana. And we're going to, we already had a report on climate from two members of Southeast Wisconsin Co-op. We are now moving to healthcare for all. And Lynn Carey, who is also joining our education fund board, was voted on to it Thursday. So Lynn, thanks for all your work and thank you for joining us to represent the Co-op. Thanks, Dr. Craig. It's my pleasure to give a brief update on what healthcare co-op has been up to and we've been very busy this year as you heard the reports from the others. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. One is um, two words to describe us are resolute and persistent because we continue to uh, fight for the ACA, have our voices heard as it continues to be challenged and right now as most of you know it's with the Supreme Court. So we want to make sure that um, our voices are heard around supporting that. And um, we've had the opportunity to continue with um, town halls, virtual town halls and phone conferences with Tammy Baldwin, with Congresswoman Gwen Moore, Congressman Mark Pocan, and uh, Attorney General Josh Call. 
We also were very instrumental. This was really quite a wonderful um, experience to have a member sister, a sister testify around the ACA at the Democratic National Convention. Some of you remember uh, retired MPS teacher, Julie Bolkholt, and she took the national virtual stage with our president-elect. And she really was very open and honest in telling her story about having an autoimmune disease whose medication actually is about $16,000 a week. And she talked about the impact of that. Um, it reminds all of us that one of the most compelling ways to advance healthcare in our country is to share stories. So we thank Julie for send, sharing her story. And also if any of you have any um, stories about using ACA or healthcare challenges, please let us know because again, the stories are the most compelling way to help move forward with the narrative. We also participated in prescription affordability teletown meetings, and that included with Tammy Baldwin and Congress, Congresswoman Gwen Moore. And finally, we, as many people have mentioned, the fight for expanding um, Badger Care continues. And we have had a lot of opportunities to testify with the governor's task force on caregiving shortage. There are now um, testimonies going on around the governor's budget, the people's budget, and we've had opportunities at both the health care and the last one related to the environment to talk about the importance of expanding Badger Care. So please, if you'd like to get involved with those, there are several left and you can just go to the website. So with that, I could go on and on, but I won't. And, um, but if you have any interest or let us know, contact Claire or our organizer, Karen Kirsch. And thank you all very much for all your outstanding work. And of course, healthcare, as we've been fighting for forever, was the top issue in 2018 that threw out Scott Walker and was the top issue again in 2020. And we have huge stepping stones we can get at the federal and state level. So please join up with Lynn and the rest of the team. Now, remember, we saw the new most urban of our co-ops, Northside Rising. Uh, we're now going to go to the most rural of our co-ops. And there's a lot of rural, but they're especially rural. That's the Driftless Co-op. We always saw him for the Dr. Farley Award. I'm going to hand it over to Lewis Coleman. Lewis, are you there? All right. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, yep, go right okay, in. Great. Um, hello, I'm Lewis Kuhlman, as um, Dr. Craig mentioned. Um, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Driftless Co-op. So we're up to 95 dues paying members after just about 16 months of starting this co-op. So that's a great uh, testament to our leadership. Um, Glenn Wilson has been um, a great leader here. Um, these members have successfully introduced and lobbied for and passed resolutions committing La Crosse County to 100% clean renewable energy by 2050. Members also introduced, lobbied for, and passed a resolution in La Crosse County supporting Medicare for All. And this was the first Medicare for All resolution passed in Wisconsin, and now communities across the state are replicating our work. The co-op also conducted its first interviews and endorsements for elected office which included uh, Chris Marion, Steve Doyle, Josephine Janes, and Joni Anderson as candidates for office. Um, we work to help local area businesses and nonprofits by expanding Wisconsin's work share and enrolling them in, in these programs, um, which create relief for workers and struggling businesses during the worst points of the spring and summer COVID-19 outbreak. We organized two dozen volunteers uh, to help on election day by serving as poll workers and poll observers to make sure everyone in La Crosse County could vote safely and free from intimidation and free from COVID infection. We've hosted uh, events after election day as well to make sure that every vote was counted and that we keep organizing for a better tomorrow. And these events were attended by over 100 people and were covered by multiple uh, Driftless Area media outlets. And um, we've also successfully organized over 225 voters in Vernon County uh, to lobby against the expansion of the wild orchid um, confined animal feedlot operation. 
And then also in Vernon County, we lobbied for the uh, Vernon, County, Vernon County Electric Co-op to develop on-bill financing, which was talked about earlier, um, program to allow members to upgrade their homes uh, with energy efficient upgrades at no upfront, crop, uh, upfront cost. And this program creates local jobs, reduces carbon emissions, and saves people money at all the same time. Um, one of the big things we started too was a, a rural issues team to help us build a truly inclusive rural urban alliance. And um, other than that, we've hosted a number of protests, days of action, and events in multiple towns and cities across the Driftless region, um, expanding, our, expanding our reach beyond just lacrosse. Um, these events highlight the issue, these events highlighted issues such as Black Lives Matter, saving the USPS, healthcare stories, taking a stand against medical debt, the effect of dark money on our elections, free and fair elections, and the need to fight climate change, um, and so much more. So uh, thank you for your time, and I'll look forward to seeing you later. Thank you very much, Lewis. And let me just call out that Vernon Electric Rural Co-op, this is the first on-bill financing plan of any utility in Wisconsin that was accomplished by the Driftless Organizing Co-op. And as Rafi explained how transformative that is, that that's the financing mechanism for a massive conversion of, of every house and every apartment in, the, in, in Wisconsin uh, to green energy and energy conservation. It's a huge step in meeting the climate targets. And, we, and now we're set to push other utilities and the for-profit utilities to do it. So I'm gonna hand it over now, thank you, Lewis, for all your great work, uh, to the final co-op report we're gonna do is from the Northwestern Wisconsin Organizing Co-op, which is, uh, its epicenter is the Chippewa Valley, but it covers a larger swath than that. And so Ken Hood is gonna report. Thank you, Ken, for joining us. Hi, happy to be here this morning. Um, and for those who don't know me, um, I've been on the field team for a while, uh, since uh, February of this year, if you can believe it. Um, so, uh, and I'm also on the, the steering committee for the Northwest Wisconsin Co-op. Uh, this past year, the Northwestern Wisconsin Co-op had a robust and active education issue team. They successfully defeated a proclamation that would celebrate voucher program schools during school choice week at the Eau Claire County Board. They also brought attention to WPEN's legislative report cards by creating and releasing press releases in several Northwestern Wisconsin districts. Uh, steering committee member and leader of the education issue team, Chris Hambuck Boyle, was proudly appointed to the Eau Claire County Board in early summer and will continue her work in protecting public schools. Um, also, our co-op held candidate forums throughout the year so that voters would be able to get as much information as possible before heading to the polls or submitting their absentee ballots. In February, prior to COVID, we had a forum with 7th Congressional District Democratic candidates Trisha Zunker and Lawrence Dale in Rice Lake. In September, we invited candidates from the Chippewa Valley to a virtual candidate forum co-hosted by Jonah and Expo to talk about issues regarding affordable health, uh, sorry, excuse me, affordable housing, healthcare, prison reform, and more. When Governor Ebers created the mask mandate, uh, the Northwest Wisconsin Organizing Co-op was able to garner over 250 emails of support sent to state legislators in our region, um, as well as uh, county board officials in our region as well. Uh, furthermore, we were able to host a town hall with Senator Jeff Smith and Representative Jody Emerson to talk more about the inaction of state legislators on this issue. And we've been working hard on pushing for health protections in Northwestern Wisconsin regarding COVID-19. We also held a press conference regarding the extension of the CARES Act unemployment benefits with Dr. Robert Craig, Representative Jody Emerson, City Council Person Emily Berge, and Senator Jeff Smith. Um, and we joined Jonah's Affordable Housing Task Force to reinvest in the conversation about the lack of affordable housing in the Chippewa Valley. Uh, we were able to talk to city planners, council members, and those directly affected about what affordable housing would look like in the Chippewa Valley and what is next. Great, uh, thank you very much. Ken and to Brianna Stanley, your organizer, and all the work that you're doing up there in that critical swing region of the state. So one of the things that we really uh, ramped up on when we first start, started creating the organizing co-ops, and this was driven by the members, was the whole fair maps issue. And you know how that's gonna come to a head during this cycle. 
And it was great to have a co-op member who was leading a major campaign and just to plug our activists in rather than having to invent any campaign at our staff level. So we have Sachin Chetta to tell us where we are, and he worked with our members and is still across the state. And uh, in addition, he uh, was a founding member of the Southeast Wisconsin Co-op, and I just saw that he is renewing his membership, so I, I've been remiss not in encouraging people to join if you're not a member and to renew if you need to, if you need to re-up. But Sachin, let us know how we're gonna win this, because we can't have another 10 years of these maps. Absolutely, Robert, and thanks so much for having me, and it's great to see all of you here and taking the time on a Saturday morning to support Citizen Action of Wisconsin. Just a phenomenal organization. I had the privilege of being an organizer for Citizen Action uh, myself, a union uh, uh, represented organizer 20 years ago, um, and it's just a great pleasure to be with so many friends. Um, I wanted to start, I, I'll try to go a little quicker than I planned, knowing that we're over time here, but I wanted to start with just a little bit of acknowledgement of the work that people have put into their Zoom backgrounds. Um, I really think it's important to recognize that that is a way that we uh, interact with one another. Um, I, some, some of these folks have, have turned their cameras off and, and I'm sure I missed some of the good ones, but uh, Scott and Angelique and Randy, you all have like the greatest angles, like unusual angles and, and, and great shots. Um, Jeff and Margaret, you did a phenomenal job of getting two people into your shot. My wife and I really struggle with that, like finding a way to get two people into the shot and then have a decent background. Lynn and Zoe, you had some great art. Um, Dana, your lighting was just perfect. Um, Matt and Kevin, you guys get the awards for the most stuff on the wall. Um, Ken, you get an award for the best use of post-its. And so it shows that you're actually working on a Saturday because there's so much work happening in that office. And finally, Robert, um, you have the best metal filing cabinet, but man, you got a nice desk, you got a great setup. Get yourself a wood filing cabinet, Robert, come on. We're just gonna ask you to, to make that investment here as we go forward. Um, so uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, hopefully we've got a little bit of energy going as we get to the close of the meeting here. Um, I'm not gonna explain what gerrymandering is. I think a lot of you have been dealing with this for a long time and you've known over the last five, eight years as we've been talking about it, how critical it is that um, and how bad it has been for Wisconsin that politicians have been choosing their voters for these last 10 years instead of voters choosing their politicians. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the bigger picture and then about what's gonna happen next. The first is I want people to really understand the theory of the case, right? It's not just the mechanical process by which maps are drawn that we're fighting for fair maps. Um, yes, we need people to choose their politicians and that seems <coughs> obvious and fundamental. Um, but I wanna talk about the impact of that and, and what it means to have people choose their politician, why it's important. The biggest thing I think, and we don't talk about this enough, is that it reduces the power of the leadership in Madison. So when we complain about Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald, and frankly, although they're friends of mine, it's also about talking about the democratic leadership, but all of the power of the caucuses gets centered into those leaders when we have gerrymandering because you know who's gonna win and the primaries in our top two primary system or our top one primary system, right, for each party, uh, it just increases the power of the base of the parties uh, in a way that makes it hard for citizens and movements and activists to influence legislators. We actually want legislators who are less ideological and who are more subject to the public pressure of the people, right? And this goes to what Ted was talking about is that like, we have to take the relationships we have with people who are in, in, in the legislature and not just try to elect people who already agree with us, but elect people who are gonna be responsive to argument and responsive to public pressure. Um, so we get greater diversity in the caucuses if we have fair maps. That might mean more moderate members or more members or more politicians who kind of swing with you know, uh, what's happening out in the world. And the reason that's good for activists like us, for those of us who believe in you know, Saul Alinsky organizing and getting people motivated to, to contact their legislators and having town halls and, and causing influences, we want malleable politicians who will actually be responsive to pressure. We don't just want politicians who are ideologically set and who are not gonna listen to us. And, and then we are just stuck electing people that we agree with. And if we fail at electing people that we agree with, then we're not able to make change. And so we really want competitive districts and legislators who are, who are responsive to their districts so we can return power to the people. And that's a fundamental value in our democracy 
that has been lost, right? That these are representative democracy. This is a representative democracy that we live in. And I think that aligns with the movement politics that we're trying to build through organizations like Citizen Action, where we elevate issues and organize people and then apply pressure to politicians. So that leads us then to where are we? Where are we in this process? And so I just want to talk about a couple of the mechanical steps. First of all, we need to have a census. And, and this isn't just like, I guess, obvious to people, right? Like the, there's a reason that the census triggers a redrawing. And the reason is that federal courts have ruled that the Constitution requires one person, one vote districts, that we have to have districts that are equal population. And so when you deliver a new census every 10 years, that proves publicly that the districts are not equal population anymore because some districts have lost population and some districts have gained population. And it triggers the redrawing of the lines, right? So that's why it happens at this moment in time. The census has essentially been completed, the 2020 census, but it has to be delivered, which means that they have to like take all the data and put it together and deliver it to the states to say, here is your population and block by block, here is where people live. And that is something that the US Census Bureau does. They're going to do that they're supposed to do that by the end of March, March 31st by federal law. Most observers think they're not gonna be able to meet that deadline because of COVID. That it's just gonna be impossible for the Commerce Department and the US Census Bureau to deliver the census to states by March 31st. They just stopped counting people at the end of last month and there's still a lot of work to be done to manage you know, 330 people, the million people that they've counted or however many people we find that we have. Um, and obviously the Trump administration has done a lot to, to, to screw with the census, to make this a harder process, to make it harder for us to count everybody, including undocumented people and children and people in prisons and everything else, right? We wanna count every human being that lives uh, full time in the United States or, or at least half time. And you're right, Cindy, Cindy just made a comment that it wasn't really properly, it was cut short, right? That the Census Bureau said, we need at least another month, if not more, of having people knock on doors and the Trump administration cut it off and, and basically fired all the, the census takers. My son was one of them who was going door to door trying to reach households that hadn't uh, returned their census survey. Um, and so we don't know exactly when the census is going to come is the conclusion of that. It's going to happen in April or May or June, we think of next year. Then what happens normally, and by normally I mean kind of going back decades, is bottom up, each municipality is supposed to redraw their own wards based on their new census information block by block. Now, 10 years ago, the Republicans didn't wait for that. They didn't wait for the city of Milwaukee and the city of Wausau and the town of Swamico and whoever it is out there, all of our thousands of municipalities in the state of Wisconsin to draw their own lines, which is really the way it should be done. We're a local control state, bottom up, people at, on town boards and village boards and city councils know how to draw these lines in the ways that make the most sense. And then you want the state to follow the local ward lines. Well, 10 years ago, they didn't do that. And so they kind of just drew these assembly districts and drew these Senate districts, and they forced municipalities to comply with those rules. We're hoping that under Governor Evers and under you know, the Biden administration, that that's not how it's gonna happen. But we do think that the legislature might try to, to short circuit that process the good thing, and I'll talk about this more in a second, is the governor can potentially veto uh, maps that are drawn unfairly. But normally what happens is you have a, quite a few months in which this, each municipality in the state, each town, village, and city, and then each county kind of draws their ward lines and their districts, and then finally the state legislature draws the state legislative district and the, and the congressional districts. What will likely happen as soon as the census is delivered is lawsuits will start flying. And there will be lawsuits in federal court and there will be lawsuits in state court. And our job as activists and as, as people who support fair maps is to keep the issue in the public eye and keep telling people the value of fair maps. Now the governor's done this great thing called the People's Maps Commission, which is saying, look, let's draw maps through a fair, open, honest, nonpartisan, transparent process. And uh, let's, take, um, let's take those maps uh, and, and, and compare them to the, the maps the politicians draw. But it's gonna take them a little time to do that. They're not gonna draw those maps in like three weeks, right? It's gonna take them some time. So they're not gonna be able to deliver those maps until later in 2021. And if the legislature tries to jump the gun, we're gonna be in a lot of legal fights. And what's important for all of you is while the lawyers are fighting these things out, we keep this thing in the public eye, 
we've been having town halls. We write op-eds. We write letters to the editor. We organize rallies and press conferences. What has changed through the Fair Maps Coalition is we've educated the public that fair maps are a thing they should care about, and we've engaged the public to participate in this conversation in a way that didn't happen, really, honestly, 10 years ago, right? That, like, they kind of did it behind closed doors. Activists really weren't paying enough attention. We weren't engaging the public, and we've really uh, kind of changed that. Um, and so while these legal fights are happening, I don't want anyone on this call, anyone in citizen action to say, let's just wait for the, the lawyers to do their thing. We will try to provide guidance. We're in deep conversation with the lawyers who are leading the fight. Um, it's being led by Doug Poland, who is a lawyer at Law Forward. He's organized a group of about 30 organizations, including Citizen Action, that meets regularly to talk about how we engage in the litigation process. They might even be asking people to um, be uh, to be uh, uh, litigants, to be parties, and we'll be recruiting people. Uh, but basically what we need people to do is know that you have to be engaged. So the last thing I'll say is they're trying to rig this thing already. They're doing stuff in a way that's incredibly corrupt. The day after the fall election, on the morning of November 4th, they released a call for comments to create a rule at the state Supreme Court so that they could try to get the entire redistricting process out of federal court and into state Supreme Court um, and let the state, the four conservatives on the state Supreme Court rig the maps. They did that intentionally, right? When we weren't paying attention because we're like, who won the election? We're exhausted. We've been working on this election. And they only gave us three weeks from November 4th to November 30th to collect comments. Now, what they didn't know is that we have this tremendous organizing capacity through the Fair Maps teams, through organizations like the co-ops and the Citizen Action, uh, uh, local groups, all these other coalition partners around the state. And we got 1,950, 1,950 comments submitted to the Supreme Court in writing by November 30th, by the afternoon of November 30th. And what I would say is that, like, that's crazy, right? That, like, we were able to do that. They made this so hard. All filings normally at the Supreme Court are required to be filed electronically, but they wanted to make it hard to submit a comment. So they required the comments to be submitted in writing, in person at the Supreme Court with 10 copies of each comment. Now, we were able to create a structure where we put up a website and collected the comments and did the printing, which they didn't kind of anticipate us doing. So they have thousands of comments saying it's a bad idea to rig this in the Supreme Court and like a dozen comments saying that they should do it that way. We're just blowing them away. We're able to drive the narrative when they have that conversation in the press. So we want you to keep paying attention. We want you to support um, the, uh, the Fair Maps Coalition at fairmapswi.com. I'll put that in the chat here. Um, and I know we're way over time. I see some questions here. So Matt, why don't you tell me um, uh, if I've got time to answer any of these questions? Uh, I'd be happy to do so. Um, and of course, we need your support at the Fair Elections Project. I saw the great link from Angelique to support Citizen Action. I'd also ask you to support us um, at fairelectionsproject.org slash donate. Take two minutes to answer some questions. Okay, so one question you asked was, will Hagedorn decide? You know, it's interesting. Pat Rogensack and Annette Ziegler actually issued a decision a few years ago saying the Supreme Court shouldn't do this process, that this should be done in federal court. Federal court has the ability to draw maps. They've been doing so fairly in state after state, including in Wisconsin for three decades. They know how to do it. So really the question is, will she be so incredibly corrupt? And the answer is probably yes, we don't know, um, to actually overrule herself, right? Uh, because she's issued a decision saying that they shouldn't do this. Um, so if it gets to state Supreme Court, yes, we do think that Hagedorn might be a swing vote, but that doesn't mean it won't go to federal court. The challenge in federal court is the decider of who decides the case in federal court is Diane Sykes, who is the, uh, the chief judge in the seventh appellate district or seventh circuit court of appeals at the federal level. She decides which three judges will hear the case. Now, we won with the Whitford case at that level, right? We had three judges. Two of them were Republican-appointed judges, and we still won the Whitford case. We got overruled at the Supreme Court, but we won at the, at the appellate court level, uh, at the circuit court level. So it's possible we could win. We'll see what happens. Um, I see another question uh, that, uh, will Wisconsin lose a congressional seat? I don't think that people anticipate that this uh, decade. I, I can't tell you what's going to happen in 2020, but I don't think that we think we're going to go from eight to seven in 2021. 20, uh, uh, um, so that was another question. Um, I do encourage people. Uh, there are two films I would really encourage people to see. Matt put a link in the chat for Can You Hear Us Now, which features Jennifer Estrada and many others. Uh, Jennifer ran for office in 2018 here in Wisconsin. Um, 
It's a great film. Um, there's also a film called Slay the Dragon. We really encourage you to watch that. That features the fight in Wisconsin a little bit. Um, and uh, I'm easy to get to, fairmapswi.com. Uh, I'll put my email in the, in the chat. And I really appreciate the time to talk to you about Fair Maps and just say, please be uh, in the fight with us. Uh, I can't even type my own email when I'm going so fast. And I know I've been talking really fast. So watch the recording if you need to hear it again. And thanks so much uh, to Robert, Matt, and the whole team. Uh, and we really appreciate it. Section, thank you for your leadership. I agree with everything you said, except on the file cabinet, which belonged to my favorite on and, <laughs> and is federal surplus from the 70s, so it has history. But anyway, other than that, we're totally aligned. Anyway, so thank you, and uh, you know how to, Section's easy to find. If people have further questions, he's, he's uh, quite ubiquitous uh, in, in our universe. So I'm gonna hand it over, we have a, one, final substantive thing. This will be five minutes and this is important to stay on for. Uh, most of you or many of you know Kevin Kane, our longtime organizer and leader here at Citizen Action. He is still very connected to us. He has created, he, he left in October, but he hasn't gone far. He has created his own social enterprise to really jumpstart the Green New Deal. And it, it, he's, we're gonna be working, we are already and still are working closely with him and he will be a Citizen Action affiliate because we have an organizational member. So Kevin is still very much present, but in a new role that's gonna help build our joint vision. So Kevin, go ahead and explain what you're up to and how people can get involved. Well, first off, I wanna say, I, you know, I'm, I've been extremely proud to be part of an organization that has led to uh, people having health insurance, getting uh, decent wages, creating good jobs, protecting jobs, fighting for democracy. And, and even just listening to all this again, just blows me away with how much we're able to do. So I'm, I'm impressed with all of you guys. So much so that I'm extremely excited to be a member of Citizen Action, not just a staff person of it. Um, we, many of you guys know, we were launching efforts at Citizen Action. Some of you guys have talked about it, trying to figure out how to fight climate change in what we think is one of the most effective ways possible. And a lot of research was done during the launch of the Driftless Organizing Co-op about a year and a half ago around the idea that upgrading homes to be energy efficient has an outsized impact of just about anything society can do, uh, according to research done by the National Resource Defense Council. And so with that information, we pushed uh, to try to figure out how do you make it so the vast number of middle and moderate income people can truly afford to do the things in their home that are the most effective thing to fight climate change. And so we realized the most effective way to do that is to push large financial institutions as well as local and state governments to do all they can to truly make it affordable for people to do this. We have pushed local governments, we have pushed state governments, we have pushed banks, credit unions, and utility companies, and we have something to show for it. We have not only gotten these institutions to agree to finance and pay for deep energy efficiency retrofits, whether it's insulation or solar or plumbing or air sealing or whatever it is, but we've been successful in doing this to homes across the state from Rice Lake to Door County to La Crosse area to Milwaukee, even uh, outside Monroe, Wisconsin. We have worked with people, uh, worked with people all over the place and help create and, and support uh, jobs and local businesses all over the place. But we realized that the way to make sure we could truly get to scale to truly fight for climate change uh, and to create jobs doing this in the most effective way possible was for us to create a new social enterprise that is running in parallel with Citizen Action, but is distinct. We now call it Green Homeowners United. And I welcome any of you guys to learn about how to become a green homeowner yourself if you're not already. We wanna raise up the experiences of the people who are actively fighting to cut carbon emissions at home and to help show how you can do it too uh, in major ways that maybe you didn't necessarily think of, uh, as well as showing how people can access financing uh, in other ways where the cost of the upgrades even with all the rest of the details, is less than the savings it generates. We've accomplished that, and I know that firsthand because my house was one of them. And so Green Homeowners United is launching, has launched this fall. Uh, we're very excited about it. We have already been helping people, and we can continue to do so moving forward. We've already hired our first uh, of many, many employees uh, just within the last few weeks, and uh, we are going to be doing this all over the place. And so I'm, I'm excited to work with some of you who are on this call right now who I'm going to uh, be working on as well. Uh, here's the thing. Our vision of this is that we are creating the social enterprise to 
create jobs fighting climate change, to accomplish the goal of making it so upgrading homes are truly energy efficient, truly affordable to do, can meet the vast middle of people who thought they could not do this, but also as a method of raising money for organizing causes that will continue to advance this. So we see this as a virtuous cycle. We want to help create jobs. We want to help fight people climate change, save people money, improve housing stock, but support the kind of organizing that made this possible and will take it to the next level. Whether, again, as you've heard that term on bill financing or pushing banks to do all of this work, um, we're very excited about this. We believe in education, uh, organizing, and all the rest of that stuff. Um, but I'm going to miss all of you guys as being an actual organizer with Citizen Action, but I'm super excited to be working with you guys as a member of Citizen Action, and thank you for those of you who voted to allow me to be on the board. Uh, but I have one piece that I could really use your help with. As of right now, we have six banks, six financial institutions that have agreed to pay for upgrading homes when someone is buying or refinancing a home to throw in more money specifically for energy efficiency upgrades, six banks and credit or six banks and financial institutions. As of this moment, I don't have a single credit union that has agreed. And what we've realized is that myself or just a few of us calling and asking a financial institution to do this is not enough. We need to have our banks, those that we are customers of and members of, hear from their customers and members together with us to ask them to start offering these green mortgages and the rest of that so we can upgrade more uh, more, um, and more homes. So my ask of you is I am going to send you uh, a link. Please tell me who you bank with. Who's your credit union? Who's your bank? Whether it's on your house, your business, or your personal, because we want to find out how we can approach the Summit Credit Unions and the BMO Harris's and the, the Educators Credit Unions and say, hey, we now have 40 of your members asking you to do something where 10 of them could refinance tomorrow with this green mortgage if you say yes. Help us create that carrot and a stick method of organizing so that we can really encourage financial institutions to do the right thing for climate change as we push for state and local governments to do even more. So uh, I'm excited to work with all of you guys. Um, that website that I linked to will tell us all about our exciting program, but please let us know where you bank and we can help figure out if this program might even be able to help save uh, you money and fight climate change in your house as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. And Kevin's also joined uh, the board of directors. You just elected him, he was on that slate. And so we will, when people leave this in action, as staff people like Sachin Chetta used to work here, they just move close by in, a, in an adjacent seat. And we keep working together because we need more power to do what we need to do. I'm gonna shorten what I'm gonna say at the end. Most of you stuck with us, a vast majority, you're the best, but we, are, we definitely have run over. So I'll just say, when you think about the incredibly bold agenda, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris just ran on, and you think about what we're trying to get on the agenda at the state level, there are huge monetary economic interests that are preventing all these things from happening. The only anecdote to that in America, in a Republican form of government, small r, is organized people. Only organized people can be organized money. So we've built a lot of organized people. You've seen them on this call. You see all the participants. We need deeper, involvement, in other words, even more leadership from our existing base, and we need to keep growing our base and to represent even more people. Because the backlash from the moneyed interests that have been skimming off most of the proceeds of economic growth in the last 50 years, we're still a rich country, we just have a maldistribution, they will fight harder and harder, they have access to incredible amounts of lobbying, communications, endless ads of every kind, etc. As soon as we get moving on healthcare, the insurance industry, pharmaceutical companies, uh, the hospitals, unfortunately, they don't really act like nonprofits, they act like for-profit businesses, will be running tons of ads. In fact, they ran tons of ads in the early primary states attacking not only Medicare for all, but the public option plan that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris support. And they will run a blitzkrieg. And so we need to get even stronger, both in terms of developing our own leaders. Part of this is, developing our own leadership capacities as a movement and working with a lot of other people like Sachin and like Kevin and all sorts of folks that haven't come up in this hour. And we need to keep growing and represent more and more people. And so if you're not already, I urge you, 
uh, to join one of the organizing co-ops or renew your membership if you, uh, if you need to renew. I also want to let folks know, uh, uh, Angelique put some mentions of people doing this uh, up there, the Homestead Association. You can also fund scholarships for low-income folks who can't afford to be co-op members, which we need to represent. And of course, the big challenge, going and having a African-American centered organizing co-op Northside Rising, we're going into an area which, is, which has very low incomes because structural racism is not only a history and a legacy, it is ongoing. And you see it in the economic statistics and the health statistics. Milwaukee was recently ranked 50th and fifth of 50 in African-American wellness of the 50 major metro areas. That's outrageous. The fact that we let that be the new normal, let a Great Depression go on for African-Americans when we have growth for other people, it's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, but there will be a lot of people who will stand against that, who lots of economic developers and other people who are skimming money off the trough and benefit from the current system. So please join, and if you're able, please fund scholarships for others for, at Northside Rising. And of course, there are low-income people in every region, and a lot of folks in rural areas that uh, rural folks need to understand that we need to invest in them, like the New Deal did originally, and that this sort of the Republican agenda has nothing for them other than uh, quite frankly, the junk food of, struck, uh, of, of um, strategic racism. And so with all of that, thank you very, very much for all you have done and all you're going to do, and we will keep you posted on the big opportunities. I really think that we have to have accomplishments at the federal level, or we have the opportunity. In, in four years, we may get a proto-fascist who's even more competent than Trump. He's, his, his weakness is complete incompetence and that would be even more dangerous. So we're not out of the woods. And at the state level, governor's seat is up in two years. We need some serious, bold agenda items to, to both to accomplish in this budget and to run on if Robin Voss and uh, the Senate, a state Senate are gonna block it. And we need to do that with the new maps that we are going to win, working with Section and many others uh, based on Section's uh, uh, presentation. And so there's a lot to do. Only organized people can do this. And please join. Please help others join. Please help our organizers recruit additional people. And please be active. And please be willing to develop your own leadership skills. We, and it's not only members. Staff is developing our skills. This is a lifelong learning. No one has all the skills they need to make this happen. But together, we can take back Wisconsin and America, as we are already taking steps to doing. So thank you everyone. Have a great Saturday afternoon and please be safe. We are about, we have another three, four months of a, of a winter of a pandemic that and we see the fruits of right-wing governance right now. This is what conservative governance as they currently call it, radical right governance leads to. And so please, everyone stay safe. It's going to get safer. We're going to start to have a CDC that gives us real information. We're going to start to have a government that actually does its job and tries to protect the people starting the third week of January. So thank you very much, everyone. And, uh, and we will see you in 2021. I think we were going to have musical bumpers, but oh well. Not all tech works. <laughs> no, I love it. No, thank you, Robert, for an amazing event. And thanks so much yep. to all the listening members. We all love you and appreciate you and are in awe of everything you do. Make some noise. Come off mute. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Robert.